rights to vote, to work, to have gender parity, to equal pay. International Women's Day was honored for the first time in Austria, Denmark, Germany, and Switzerland on 19th March 1911. Later in 1914, International Women's Day was agreed to be marked annually on March 8th. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. As the American writer and activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton said, the best protection any woman can have is courage. It is only her courage and devotion to science that made Marie Curie the only person to win two Nobel Prizes in two different disciplines, even after getting rejected by the university because she was a woman. On this note, we have with us today three eminent women scientists who have shown excellence in their respective fields. I welcome our dignitaries, Honorable Principal Professor Dr. Montu Kumar Dash, IQSC Coordinator and Head of the Department, Department of Physics, Ghatal Robindra Shatavarshiki Mohabit Dalai, Dr. Ashok Kumar Mondopadhyay, Dr. Koshik Ghosh, Associate Professor and Head of the Department, Chemistry, Ghatal Robindra Shatavarshiki Mohabit Dalai, and all the participants from different departments and colleges all over the nation. And last but not the least, my beloved students to the celebration of women achievers in science. I would now like to request Dr. Koshik Ghosh to kindly deliver the introductory address. Dr. Ghosh. Sir, please unmute yourself. Good morning. It is matter of great delight that we are going to begin a one day international webinar on contribution of women scientists in academia and industry, organized by the Department of Chemistry in collaboration with IQC Khatal Rabindra Shatavarsiki Mohabit On behalf of the seminar organizing committee, I do hereby extend a very warm and cordial welcome to all the distinguished guests, eminent SESOS person, delegates coming from different universities and colleges, my colleagues and my beloved students. Today, we are privileged to have among us the glorious presence of Professor Sumita Vasu, Dr. Teresa Aditya, and Ms. Konkonapal. All of them are extremely busy person who out of their very tight schedule, manage time to present here among us. We are immensely thankful to them all. In 1929, the leading anatomist, and the first woman to be elected to the U.S. National Academy of Science, Florence Rena Sabine, once rightly said that it matters little whether men or women have the more brains. All we women need to do the extra our proper influence is just to use all the brains we have. Now, in 2022, there are numerous prominent women scientists who are leading groundbreaking research across the world. However, it was only in the late 19th and early 20th century that many countries in the world acknowledged science as a clear career path for women. This, this enabled us to witness the triumph of the like of Mary Curie, Dorothy Fryerfoot, Hodgkin, and Barbara McClincock, etc. Closer home, we have seen the elements of Ananda Bai Joshi, the first Indian woman physician and first woman to have graduated with a two-year degree in Western medicine in the United States. Janoki Amal, the first Indian scientist to have received the Padmasri Award in 1977. Kamala Soni, the first Indian woman to have backed a PhD degree in the scientific discipline. Asima Chatterjee, the great Indian phytochemist. And Rajasri Chatterjee, the first woman engineer from the state of Karnataka, to name a few. But despite 
they are remarkable discoveries. Women still represent just 33.3% of researchers globally, and their work rarely gains the recognition it deserves. Less than 4% of Nobel Prizes for science have ever been awarded to women, and only 11% of senior research roles are held by women in Europe. In the coming sessions, we shall listen to the deliberations regarding contribution of women scientists in diverse fields of academia and industries from three renowned women scientists who have shown commendable performance in their respective areas of research and academia. This webinar will provide an effective platform for exchange of knowledge and information among the invited speakers, researchers, delegates, students, and I do firmly believe that the participants in general will be highly benefited from it. A good number of renowned scientists and academicians are here, and all of us are keenly interested to listen to their valuable lectures. So I conclude my thanking you all and looking forward to an extremely productive discussion. <coughs> Have a good day. Thank you, sir. I would now uh, like to request our honorable principal, sir, Do Professor Dr. Montukumar Dash to kindly deliver the inaugural address. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bandhubadhai. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. It is indeed a unique, memorable moment for me. The 8th March 2022. Good morning, everybody. Please unmute uh, all the participants. Please unmute yourselves. I request all the participants to kindly unmute yourselves. Sorry, mute yourselves. Sorry, mute yourselves. Please. Please. May I start now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Good morning, everybody. It is indeed a unique, memorable moment for me today, the 8th March 2022, as at this moment, I find a number of star scientists, especially women scientists, from the length and breadth of the country in the national international webinar entitled Contribution of Women Scientists in Academia and industry organized by the Department of Chemistry in collaboration with IQAC of Ghatal Rabindra Satavarshiki, Mohavidyalai, Pashtim Medinipur, West Bengal, India. This gives me an opportunity to welcome all dignitaries, teachers, research scholars, and students participants from different colleges, universities, and research institute my dear colleagues, supporting staff, and my beloved students of my college from the innermost core of my heart. I am honored to welcome Professor Basu, former head of the department, Chemical Science Division, Saha Institute of Nuclear Physics, for join with us to deliberate his speech on contemporary issue. I am extending my warm welcome to Professor Dr. Teresa Aditya, postdoctoral research fellow, Pennsylvania State University, USA, and Mrs. Konkona Paul, assistant manager, I, on behalf of the college, heartily 
Oh, where it comes? Hadilio oil comes. Sorry. Uh, International Women's Day is celebrated on 8th March every year around the world. And it's the day dedicated to celebrating women's achievement in areas. Sorry, many phones are coming from different places. Let me switch off. Okay, so, and it's the dedicated to celebrating women's achievement in various social, political, cultural, uh, education, science, technology, in various fields. And, sorry, I am disturbing by some fellow. And you must be wondering why Women's Day is celebrated on 8th March. Well, there is a brief history around it that goes back 109 or 10 years ago. And it was in 1909 when a political party of America celebrated 15,000 women who protested against various issues like low pay scale, equal opportunity, and lack of voting rights in New York City. Originally, it was called National Women's Day, and as the new spread annual celebration was done across the world, but it was Russia who set the March 8th date, and it was in 1975 that the United Nations recognized International Women's Day, and from 1996, International Women's Day became a theme to celebrate women in society. <clears throat> now, as you know, when and who established it now naturally the next question that arises and it what is significance of Women's Day? Uh, it is celebrated to give equal rights, gender equality to the, uh, to the women. And we know that women has the power for social reform. And their power starts from our home. And a home or a family cannot be happy without a woman and without the power of women. In every sphere, in institutes, research institute, academic institution, we have seen the power of women, but we are not habituated or our society is not habituated to show respect or to give the credit of their achievements from the ancient times. That's why we are celebrating this year to give respect to the women for their achievements in various disciplines. And starting from ancient era, we have seen how women have faced different problems in their research organization, in their academic institutions, or in their workplace. And government is trying to overcome the problem faced by the women. But we, the common people, should join our hands together to remove all those problems in the society. And I can uh, say a few words about the uh, highest achievement of the women in different branches of social, education, or science sectors. That Nobel Prize, that is a very prestigious award, but our achievements made by women is 
very small. Only 18 women have won Nobel Prize in peace out of 109. It is only 16.5% of the total award. So, and 16, won, 16 ladies won Nobel Prize in literature and which is 13.6% of the total award. And total 12 number of women won Nobel Prize in medicine that is only 5.4% of the total Nobel Award in medicine. And when we go into the basic sciences, this number is poor and poor. Actually, we are not encouraging our girl childs to study basic sciences. We are not encouraging them to get admitted in reputed institutions as those institutions are co-educational institutions. That's why only seven ladies, women scientists, won Nobel Prize in chemistry, which is only 3.7% of total Nobel Prize awarded in chemistry. And only four women scientists got Nobel Prize in physics. That is very poor, only 1.8% of the total, only total. So this is the scenario of women contribution in different fields. And for this, we the men are responsible. So we should come together to join our hands. We should start empowering our girl child from our home so that their contribution will be more and the society without women, without open education, without women contribution cannot survive or cannot sustain. And the theme of 2020 International Women's Day is gender equality today for a sustainable tomorrow. For sustainable development of a nation or a country, gender equality is a must. And we should place all genders in equal place. I expect through deliberation of the eminent young scientists who joined with us will be enlightened our participants, our students to a greater extent. So hoping this, I again welcome all dignitaries, research persons, and my students, my colleagues, supporting staffs. Once again, so I declare the webinar open. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your encouraging words. Uh, now I would like to request uh, IQSC coordinator Ghatal Robindra Shatubar Shiki Mohabit Dalai, Dr. Ashok Kumar Bondopadhyay, who is also the head of the department, Department of Physics, uh, Ghatal Robindra Shatubar Shiki Mohabit Dalai. Uh, Dr. Bondopadhyay, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Okay, thank you. Uh, good morning to all. Respected Principal, uh, Dr. Montu Kumar Dash, our Honorable uh, Resource Persons, my dear colleagues, students, and participants, I convey a hearty welcome 
to all of you to this international international webinar which is organized by our chemistry department of our college ghatal rubindra satavarshik mahavidyalay thanks to our honorable speakers for accept, accept, accepting our invitations as we know that international women's day is observed on 8th march each year the day aims to honor the achievement of women and this day acknowledges the value and importance of women in our lives and all around the world a woman has various roles to play in her life women's day recognizes and celebrates women in every field this day also serves as an action for accelerating gender parity so from 198 onwards women raised their voices about oppression and inequality a demand rate on various issues such as uh, gender equality uh, reproductive rights and violence and abuse against women the theme of international women's day 2022 is a gender equality for a sustainable tomorrow the team recognizes and celebrated women and girls who are highlighting the issues of climate change are taking the charge and leading this year the team is to celebrate and honor them this day is a reminder of a gender equal world a world that has no room for bias stereotype differences and everyone is treated equally advancing gender equality is one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century full and equal access and participation and innovation for development for women and girls of all ages is imperative for achieving gender equality and the empire empowerment of women and girls uh, remember half of world's citizens are women if we do not utilize the power of women we cannot achieve a truly peaceful society and sustainable development gender roles were largely deterministic in 18th century the 19th century saw major advances in education for women and girls when women get the credit they deserve they can become a role model to inspire the next generation of girls some of the most important discoveries and inventions made by women 
in the past hundred years and give them give them credit as Dr. Sarle Jackson, the first black woman to receive a PhD award from MIT, he conducted breakthrough scientific research with subatomic particles. Our research enabled us to invent the portable box, solar cells, fiber optics, fiber cables, and technology uh, behind call ID and call waiting. For this emerging women, we get all these important information. And Franklin, who revealed DNA structures, creating the foundation of modern virology. And at last, I would mention Mary Curie, who paved the way for scientists to study a radioactive decay and discovered, you know everybody, two elements, a radium and polonium. She is the first woman to receive a Nobel Prize in physics. She became also the first person to receive a second Nobel Prize in chemistry. I think uh, more than 40 women scientists awarded Nobel Prize. Honor to their legacy by committing to encourage women to pursue a career in science. I would like to convey my sincere wish to all people, regardless of gender, age, to recognize their potential and work together for a bright and vibrant future. At last, I must give thanks to all of the teachers of the chemistry department of our college for their very positive in involvement to arrange this webinar. I hope this webinar will be fruitful and very useful to all the participants. Also, I sincerely hope the lectures will motivate our students. Once again, on behalf of our college authority, I convey my hearty and warm welcome to all of you. Thank you all for being with us. Okay. <clears throat> now, Momita, you can start the next session. Okay, thank you, sir. Now, Dr. Momita Gangobadhyay will announce the first technical session of this webinar as a chairperson. Thank you, sir. Without any further delay, we'll directly go to our first technical session. I feel honored to introduce... I feel honored to introduce the keynote speaker of this webinar, Professor Shomita Basu. Professor Basu did her MSc and B.Sc. and M.Sc. in Chemistry from Presidency College, Calcutta University, and Ph.D. from Jadukpur University in 1989. She did her doctoral research on spectroscopy under the supervision of Professor Mihir Choudhury at Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science, Jadukpur, Kolkata. After that, she joined St. Xavier's College, Kolkata as a lecturer in chemistry in 1990. 
She joined as a faculty member <laughs> at the Chemical Sciences Division of Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics, Kolkata in 1992 and retired from the institute as a senior professor and head of the department in December 2018. The broad area of her research is spectroscopy, focusing on photochemistry and spin chemistry on electron transfer and hydrogen abstraction reactions between small therapeutic important molecules and protein, DNA, nanomaterials, etc. in homogeneous and heterogeneous media. She supervised 16 PhD students and the number of papers published in peer-reviewed journals, including book chapters, is more than 150. Along with her research work, she used to teach MSc students at Calcutta University and Bidhanagar College. Professor Basu was elected as a fellow of the West Bengal Academy of Science and Technology in the year 2010 for her contributions in the field of molecular spectroscopy. She was awarded Professor P.K. Bose Memorial Award in 2012 and Professor K.K. Rohadgi Mukherjee Memorial Award in 2021 from Indian Chemical Society. She was also an executive committee member of International Spin Chemistry for over 15 years. Presently, she is continuing her research work and also teaching at Calcutta University, Vidhannagar College, Barashat University, and JBNSTS Kolkata as guest teacher. With these few words, I would like to request Professor Basu to kindly share her research experience with us. Professor Basu. Thank you, Mumita, for your kind introduction. Now, good morning, everybody. Uh, I like to thank uh, uh, the organizers, especially Professor Das, the principal sir, and uh, Bhumita Ganguly, uh, whom I know from her research days, for inviting me to join this webinar and uh, give a talk on my work based on photochemistry, the excited, st excited state phenomena uh, of the molecules. Now I like to present my slides. Now, uh, it is visible, ma'am. Yeah, it is visible. Now, uh, I like to uh, give a very short introduction because we have heard uh, about Women's Day uh, from Mumita, from Dr. Ghosh and Banerjee, Dr. Banerjee and Professor Dash, uh, and uh, their introduction was very nice. Okay. And uh, so, uh, but I like to men mention other things that uh, in our life, uh, from the first day, uh, we meet our mother. Okay, we know our mother. And mother is our uh, best uh, teacher, guide, as well as friend. Now, later, uh, we meet other women uh, as family members, as neighbors, as teachers, as well as as friends. Okay, and we cannot deny their contribution and inspiration in our life, uh, which helps us uh, to grow up properly. Okay? And in science, uh, it has been mentioned by all of uh, the, uh, all of the, all of previous um, speakers, the name of Marie Curie. Okay. And uh, Marie Curie, we know that she uh, got Nobel prizes twice. Uh, for the discovery of radioactivity and radioactive elements. But apart from that, apart from science, Marie Curie was a, a, was a social worker. In First World War, she helped the wounded soldiers. And she, with her daughter, Irene Juliet Curie, uh, had installed uh, mobile X-ray machines and also radiological units in at the uh, field hospitals. Okay? And she also trained other women uh, to do this service. Next, I like to mention the name of uh, Rosaline Franklin. She was also a chemist and X-ray crystallographer. And uh, she, her work uh, was focused on the understanding of the molecular structures of DNA, RNA, and viruses. Now, in our students' days, we have met another celebrity woman, and she is 
professor oshima chatterji at rajawaja science college kolkata and uh, she has uh, a huge work on organic and med medicinal chemistry now in our msc classes Uh, Professor Mee Choudhury, as uh, Mumita mentioned, that he is my supervisor, PhD supervisor. He taught us photochemistry, and in our classes, he mentioned the name of a book, and that is on fundamentals of professor uh, photochemistry, and that book was written by Professor K K Ruhadgi Mukherjee. At that time, she was in Jadavpur University and head of the chemistry department, and. Uh, in uh, that book uh, was very interesting and was written very lucidly and you see that most of the aspects of photochemistry uh, was covered in that book and the beauty of the book is that each chapter contains a summary at the end and so uh, the teachers students as well as researchers were benefited from her book okay and on the preface in the preface of the book there was logo and this is a logo for indian photobiology society and she was the secretary founder of this photobiology society and there is a sanskrit shloka the meaning in english of that shloka is that all that exists was bo uh, born from the sun now you see this is the absorption this is the spectrum of the sunlight okay and uh, you can find This this spectrum covers the ultraviolet region that means 200 to 400 nanometer, and the visible region that means 400 to 800 nanometer, and higher region beyond 800 nanometer. Okay, and the signs which comes up with the absorption of light from sun or from the light source having wavelength within this region is called photo signs. That may be physics, chemistry, biology. or an integrated one and uh, these are termed as photophysics photochemistry or photobiology now the best example of this uh, science photo science is the photosynthesis where sun is the source of energy okay now uh, you see that Uh, in this process in this photochemical phenomena photochemical uh, reactions actually electrons are uh, excited from the highest occupied molecular orbital to lowest unoccupied molecular orbital that means we can have an electronic transitions here and uh, first of all uh, we have to know what is molecular orbital very simply we, i can tell you that when two atomic orbitals are overlap uh, uh, can overlap with each other in phase then we can have symmetrical sigma bonding orbital and if they overlap out of phase then we can have anti bonding unsymmetric uh, unsymmetrical uh, sigma star orbital okay now similarly Uh, from p p orbitals we can have either sigma or sigma star orbital or we can have pi bonding or orbital or pi star anti bonding orbital okay now i can show you the energy diagram of this orbital and you can find the energy uh, of sigma is the lowest and then pi then n then pi star and then sigma star n is the non bonding orbital where the non bonding electrons are found okay and just by absorbing this uv visible light we can have either n to pi star transitions or pi to pi star transitions now uh, if you want to uh, realize or if you want to understand the this uh, light absorption process and uh, the uh, and the consecutive phenomena then we can use this simple jablonski diagram here you can see this ground state that means which represents that uh, these two electrons remain in homo highest occupied molecular orbital and you can find that the spin of these two electrons is anti parallel so total spin angular momentum is equal to 0 and spin multiplicity is equal to 
2s plus 1, that means 1. So this state is called, is termed as singlet state. Okay? And after absorbing light, we can have transitions from a 0 to higher singlet states where you can find electrons, one in HOMO and another in LUMO with antiparallel spin configuration. Now, this absorption process is very fast. The time scale of this absorption process is of the order of femtosecond. That means 10 to the power minus 15 seconds. Now, from the uh, excited singlet state, the molecules will come down to the lowest singlet state just by non-radiative transitions, which is termed as internal conversion. And from the S1, that means lowest excited single state, the molecules will come down to the ground state either by internal conversion or by radiative fluorescence. Now, the time scale of this non-radiative process is of the order of picoseconds, that means 10 to the power minus 12 seconds, whereas the time scale of fluorescence is of the order of nanoseconds, that means 10 to the power minus 9 seconds. Now, the from singlet state, we can have non-radiative intersystem crossing process so that S1 is uh, transferred to T states, that means triplet states. Here, total spin angular momentum is equal to 1, so spin multiplicity is equal to 2S plus 1 is equal to 3. That means triplet states are degenerate states. There are three states in one triplet state. Okay, now from the triplet state, we can find uh, that uh, molecules are uh, coming down to the uh, ground state either by non-radiative intersystem crossing or by radiative phosphorescence. Now, the time scale of this phosphorescence is of the order of microseconds to milliseconds to seconds. Okay. Now, so if we can summarize these uh, processes, you see that after absorption of light, we can have electronic excitations and then the dissipation mechanism are either radiative or radiation-less mechanism. In radiative mechanism, we can have fluorescence and phosphorescence, and you can find that the energy gap between this uh, ground and excited states is greater in case of absorption than it is fluorescence. It is for fluorescence than it is for phosphorescence. So uh, fluorescence will come will arise or we can see fluorescence at the longer wavelength compared to absorption and phosphorescence we can see at the longer wavelength compared to both absorption and fluorescence. Okay, So uh, just by radiative mechanism, we can convert light to light with different frequencies. Okay? And in radiation-less mechanism, there are two processes I have mentioned, internal conversion and intersystem crossing. So net effect, light, uh, we can find light to heat. And uh, in the chemical uh, processes, uh, that means if singlet and triplet state molecules uh, can react, they will give chemistry. And that means we can convert photon to net change in free energy. Okay? And so if we really want to study uh, this absorption and fluorescence or phosphorescence, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, then we have to have these two basic instruments. One is absorption spectrophotometer, another is fluorescence spectrophotometer. Okay? And in absorption spectrophotometer, you can see uh, that this is the incident beam of light, I0, and the intensity of the transmitted light is IT, and the path length of the light is D, and if the concentration of the sample is C, then we can write uh, absorbance is equal to log 10 base I0 by IT equal to epsilon DC, where epsilon is the molar extinction coefficient, which depends on frequency or wavelength of light. This is well-known uh, lambert beers law. And uh, you can find uh, that this law uh, we can apply to measure the unknown concentration uh, of a solution and uh, wait, uh, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to uh, use this law, we have to make the solution very, very dilute. And uh, so uh, from the dilute, very, very dilute concentrated solution, uh, we can find out the value of concentration from the Lambert-Beer's law. 
And we can, uh, uh, using this Lambert Weyer's law, we can study different chemical reactions, et cetera, et cetera. That means we can study kinetics. Now, I, I, I like to give you another example. In bio, for biomacromolecules, we can also use this law. And you know that these DNA molecules, there are two strands which, which are remain uh, as helically, uh, in their helical structures, okay? And, and uh, the ab absorbance comes around, say, 260 nanometer, okay, for DNA. Now, if you hit the DNA sample solution, then you can find that the absorbance increases. Why? Because these tra two strands uh, become separated, and these bases, that means adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosines, these are exposed to light, and we can see the increase in optical density. And uh, from this graph, we can find out the temperature at which DNA will be denatured. Okay. Now, uh, similarly, in case of fluorescent spectroscopy, you can see we have to uh, plot net fluorescence intensity versus wavelength, and then we can find this fluorescent spectrum. Okay. And in case of fluorescence, this uh, light source will be uh, passed to the excitation monochromator, this monochromator can select the proper wavelength, and we will fix the wavelength from the absorption spectrum. And from that, light will uh, fall on the sample. And from the sample, we can have fluorescence. And to avoid scattered light, we have to collect fluorescence at the right angle of that directions, of the excitation light directions. And when it is passing through this emission monochromator and uh, it reaches to detector and uh, processor, then we can have this type of spectrum. Now, another thing I like to mention here that optical density, that means absorbance log I0 by I, uh, this one log I0, I0 by I, this is a uh, physical parameter. That means uh, you can use absorbance as a physical parameter, but in case of fluorescence, we cannot use fluorescence as a physical parameter because you see, if we just uh, increase the intensity of light, uh, amount of fluorescence will increase, okay? So to quanti quantify fluorescence, we have to use fluorescence quantum mill, which is nothing but the ratio of photons emitted through fluorescence to photons absorbed. And we always take relative quantum mill uh, in comparison to a standard just like specific gravity, okay? And uh, now you see that if we really want to study the ground state phenomena, then we can use this absorption spectroscopy. And for excitation phenomena, we can use fluorescent spectroscopy. But if we really want to detect the short-lived species, uh, which may be fluorescent, may be non-fluorescent, and which are termed as transients, then we have to use time-resolved techniques. For time-resolved absorptions, and uh, this is for identification of non-fluorescent transients, we will use this laser flash photolysis technique. And for time-resolved fluorescence, to identify the fluorescent transients, we are generally using these uh, uh, time-resolved kinetic spectrometer based on time-correlated single photon counting technique or femtosecond and up conversions, okay? Now, when we are uh, monitoring the ground state absorption or fluorescence as a steady state phenomena, then we can use ordinary light. That, but if we really want to study the transients, that means short-lived species, then we have to use a light which has pulse width lesser than the time scale of the transients. So we know that fluorescence lifetime is of the order of nanoseconds. So if we really want to study the uh, fluorophore moiety at its excited state, then we have to use a light source which has time span or pulse width lesser than the uh, lifetime of the fluorophore. So we have to use laser because laser can give us uh, pulse width of the order of nanoseconds, picoseconds, or femtoseconds. Now, uh, in case of time-resolved fluorescence studies, 
we have used, uh, we are using these diode lasers and you can see that actually the result which we are getting is that here fluor uh, fluorescence intensity uh, is plotted against time at a particular wavelength. And we can have such a decay profile which uh, we have seen in our chemical kinetics chapter, okay? And from this decay profile, we can find out the rate constant and the fluorescence lifetime is the inverse of the rate constant. Similarly, in uh, if we really want to study the uh, non-fluorescent transients, and we have to use laser flash photolysis technique, that is an absorption technique. Here we are using laser to excite the molecule from ground singlet to higher singlet states, and from there it will go to triplet states. Triplet state can give phosphorescence, but this is a non-fluorescent species. Also, if the molecules react in singlet on triplet states, they will produce radicals, radical ions, etc. And all these are non-fluorescent transients. Now, to monitor this non-fluorescent transient, we have to use the pulse xenon lamp. And uh, this species, transient species, will absorb this uh, pulse, the light of this pulse xenon lamp. And if we just plot absorbance versus time, we can, at a particular wavelength, we can have this type of decay profile. And as I have told you, that from the decay profile, we can find out the decay rate constant and the average lifetime of the transients. Now, if we just plot absorbance or fluorescence versus wavelength uh, at a particular time delay after laser flash, uh, then we can have this type of spectrum, which is called transient spectrum, okay? And uh, this will, uh, this lifetime and the spectrum uh, will help us to character characterize this transient fluorescent and non-fluorescent species. Now, I uh, like to give you a very simple example. We know pH, pH that is, which measures the acidity of a sample in solution, okay? Now, uh, this, uh, just consider this acridine molecule. This is protonated acridine molecule and this equilibrium between this protonated acridine molecule and acridine uh, and the pKa value is 5.4. This tells that below 5.4, we can have a CRH plus, but above 5.4, uh, we cannot have that uh, ACRH plus. Now, if we see in the absorption spectrum, because this is the ground state acridine, you will find that at pH 2 only, that means lesser than 5.4, we can have this ACR and both ACR, both ACR and ACRH plus absorbance. Okay, this black one. But above uh, 5.4, that means at pH 7 and 11, we can have only ACR and no ACRH plus. But if we excite ACR, acridine molecule to excited state, then we can have this equilibrium AC, between this ACH plus star and AC star. And the PK star value of this equilibrium is 9.2. So below 9.2, we can have this ACH plus star, but above 9.2, we can have only AC star. So for the excited state phenomena, if we just uh, see the fluorescent spectrum at different pH, you can find at pH 2, we can have ACRH+. And also at pH 7, we can have some hydrogen bonded ACRH plus star. But at pH 11, we can have only ACR. So just by exciting the molecule in the higher state, we can change the pK value of the uh, acidic reactions, okay? Now, if we really want to study such reactions, that means if we really want to study the equilibrium between the molecule and its protonated form, then we can use reverse micelles, the R micelles, etc. Now, in case of reverse micelles, you can see these nano droplets of water are surrounded by the polar head groups of a surfactant uh, and dispersed in organic medium. And the water molecule, just uh, at the interface, they are much more acidic than the core water molecules. Now, if we just increase the water pool size, you will see the formation of uh, ACH plus increases 
as well as AC H plus star increases with the water pool size. Okay. Now, if we do uh, the time resolved studies, you can find this is that these are the decay profiles at the lower end, uh, lower wavelength range. This is the decay profile of uh, AC ACR star. And this uh, at the higher wavelength, we can find the decay profile of ACR H plus star. And if we just uh, draw the time resolved fluorescent spectrum, that means fluorescence uh, versus wavelength uh, at different time delay after laser flash. And then you can find after normalizations, there are two peaks. And these lines can cr uh, have crossed one single point, and this is called isoemissive point. This point indicates that these two peaks are in equilibrium. That means ACR and ACR H plus star, they are in equilibrium in the excited states. And this equilibrium we can find within zero nanoseconds to 0 0.6 nanoseconds. So when we uh, study any pH uh, of the solution in laboratory, we just find what is the pH value or pK star, pK value, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But 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 by using this time resolved experiment, we can find the time scale within which we can get the equilibrium between the, pro uh, the protonated form and the original molecule. Okay, ma'am. Sorry to interrupt, ma'am. Uh, yes, Moshumi yes, yes. Bishash, please stop presenting your screen. Moshumi Bishash, please stop presenting. Thank you. Okay, now uh, now I like to mention another phenomena that is very important. It is photoinduced electron transfer mechanism, and you know this. Uh, based on this mechanism, scientists have tried to develop solar cells, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this is a me basic mechanism for photosynthesis. Okay, and there you can find two molecules. One is electron acceptor A. Another is electron donor D. Now, either acceptor or donor might be excited to the higher states, and you can find that electron will transfer from the donor to acceptor, and we can find this type of radical ion pairs. Okay. Now, these type of radical ion pairs can undergo either back electron transfer to give recombinations, that means A plus D again, or they can uh, form these free ions which are highly reactive. Now, if we really want to utilize such electron transfer reactions, we have to produce much more free ions compared to rec uh, recomb recombination reactions. Now, you will see that uh, just by increasing number of substituents in acceptor or in donor, we can change the pathways of our reactions. Okay. Now, here, uh, I have taken A-methyl carbazole or 145H9 pentamethyl carbazole as electron donor and also the chromophore. And the corresponding acceptor is 1,4-diacyanobenzene or 1,2,4,5-tetracyanobenzene. Now, you see, when ethyl carbazole uh, in the excited state uh, is reacting with diacyanobenzene, uh, we can find... a. Uh, a fluorescent species at the longer wavelength, which is termed as exciplex. That means complex form in the excited state between donor and acceptor. Okay. And so here, actually, electron transfer is taking place with the singlet chromophore, and we can find this exciplex. But instead of ethyl carbazole, if we uh, take this 14589 pentamethyl carbazole, then this pentamethyl carbazole with 1,4 diacyanobenzene or this tetracyanobenzene cannot form this type of exaplex in singlet state. But from laser flash photolysis studies, we can find out the non-fluorescent transients. That means this anions, DCB anion radical or tetracyanobenzene anion radical. Here, the mechanism is different. Here, uh, before electron transfer, uh, this intersystem crossing takes place in the carbazole unit, and this electron transfer occurs in the triplet states, and that will favor the formation of much more free ions than the recombination product. So just by changing the number of substituents, we can just change the pathways of a reaction 
uh, to form much more free ions compared to recombination product. Now, I have given you these two simple example, uh, these two examples based on simple organic molecules. But uh, if we just consider the biomacromolecules, like say proteins, DNAs, what will happen? Now, this is the uh, structure of hay egg white lysozyme. Uh, this uh, lysozyme contains fluorophore as tryptophan or tyrosines. Okay. Now, if uh, uh, we like to study drug protein interactions, that means here we have considered. Uh, menadione as a drug, uh, this is an uh, anti cancer drug, and lysozyme as the protein. You can see that this menadione interacts with lysozyme, and uh, the change in the fluorescence will follow this type of nonlinear curves. That means if we just plot fluorescence in absence and presence of quencher versus quencher concentration, we will get this type of plot, which is well known to us. It is called stand normal plot. Okay. Now, instead of lysozyme, if we take tryptophan or indole, because you see that indole is the uh, indole is the basic chromophore of this tryptophan, you can find these stand normal plots are very similar to the plot with menadion and lysozyme itself. Okay. But if we take tyrosine, we cannot find this type of uh, stand normal plot. So we can say here indole moiety of the tryptophan molecule is interacting with the menadion molecule. From the spectroscopy, we can uh, say uh, infer like that. Now we have to find out the binding constants uh, using fluorescence spectroscopy, as well as uh, we have found out the uh, stoichiometry. We have found that one menadion is uh, interacting with one tryptophan molecule of lysozyme. Now, if we want to uh, study the thermodynamic uh, parameters, then we have to use this Van Top plot, where this ln k is plotted versus 1 by t. k is the quenching rate constant at different temperatures t. Okay. And from the slope of the curve, we a straight line, we can find out uh, this um, delta A's value. And from the intercept, we can find this uh, delta H. No, sorry, full. Uh, from the slope of the curve, we can find out the delta H0. And from the intercept, we can find out this delta H0 value. And then we can find this delta G0, that means net change in free energy from this delta H and delta S values. Now, here, this type from this type of uh, plot, we can find both delta H and delta S, both are positive. And this still, uh, these values tell that the interaction is hydrophobic in nature. And we can we have also found out that delta G0 value, which is negative, and that is telling that uh, the reaction is spontaneous. Now, we have to support the results. Huh? Uh, so, we have done some docking analysis. Okay. And from that, that means theoretical studies. And docking analysis tells us that actually the menadion molecule is interacting with the indole moiety of the tryptophan 108 of lysozyme, which remains in the hydrophobic region. That means this is a hydrophobic interactions, and the theoretical calculated energy, uh, free energy value is very close to the experimental free energy values. Now, instead of simple drug molecule, if we consider this type of drug molecules, then suppose the example is merocyanin 540. Here you can find there is an benzoxazole group with sulfate, and another is thiobarbutyric acid moiety, and these are linked with hexatrine. Okay. And these molecules can have two conformers. One is cis, another is trans, but the trans conformer is much more stable than the cis conformer. And this merocyanin can interact with other proteins like HSA, serum albumins, human serum albumins or bovine serum albumins, and also with lysozyme. Now, uh, for uh, I am giving the example of the interaction of this merocyanin with lysozyme. From the absorption studies, we have found that a complex is being formed between merocyanin and lysozyme. Now, if you study the fluorescence property of these interactions, then you find at the lower concentrations, uh, the uh, lysozyme fluorescence, uh, uh, if we just increase the merocyanin concentration, the lysozyme fluorescence uh, 
quenches and uh, the peak is shifting towards uh, lower wavelength. That means it is giving, it is indicating that interaction is hydrophobic in nature. Okay, now beyond 30 micromolar merocyanin concentration, we can have reverse process. That means the peak is shifting towards the longer wavelength and uh, which tells and uh, uh, intensity of the peaks are increasing, which tells that here, the interaction is hydrophilic in nature. Now, uh, we have found out uh, this thermodynamic parameter, and surprisingly, we uh, got two types of Van Top uh, curve. That means the slopes are quite different. So we can say that they are present to, they are present two types of interactions between merocyanin and lysozymes. Okay. And uh, uh, if we do the crystallograph, and here we, we fail to support these results by docking studies. Here we have to do crystallography studies. And in crystallography study, we have found that actually the Baines oxazole unit of uh, merocyanin uh, is stacked on the tryptophan 123 of lysozyme, and the sulfate makes uh, hydrogen bonds with the arginine 125 of this lysozyme, okay? And, but uh, the thiobarbituric acid group uh, in the cis form, there are two forms, one conformer, one is cis, another is trans, trans, which we can find in the crystallography. In For the cis conformer, uh, this thiobarbituric acid remains uh, in the uh, phenyl aniline 38 and 34, uh, and in case of trans conformer, it is making hydrogen, I mean, a weak bond or hydrogen bond with tryptophan 63 of other lysozyme group. Okay, so crystallography tells us that there are two forms. One is cis form, another is trans form, which are interacting uh, with the lysozyme group. And so the nature of interactions is hydrophobic as well as hydrophilic. So we can have two sets of, uh, two different sets of Van Toff plot from the thermodynamic studies, okay? Uh, and next, I like to uh, tell about uh, some interactions with the DNA, okay? DNA is also a biologically macromolecule. Now you see these acridine molecules, uh, these are, uh, these can intercalate DNA. DNA. And now, if we take different derivatives of acridines, that means acridine, acridine yellow, proflavin, acridine orange, etc., and we can find this acridine, acridine yellow, proflavin. These three molecules can accept electrons from this DNA. Okay, because DNA is an electron donor, and these are electron acceptor. But in case of acridine orange, due to the presence of this dimethyl amino group, this molecule is acting as a very efficient electron donor molecule. So in case of acridine orange, we cannot have electron transfer between this DNA and this octidine orange molecule. So if we just see the fluorescent spectrum, you can find that for acridine, acridine yellow, and proflavin, the fluorescence intensity decreases. But in case of acridine orange, the fluorescence intensity increases. Reverse process is going on with in the in the interaction of acridine orange and DNA. Similarly, if we just measure the lifetime of the species uh, in absence and presence of uh, uh, DNA, then you can find that acridine, acridine yellow, proflavin, uh, these molecules are producing by exponential. Uh, Curve, that means they are giving two life, lifetimes in presence of DNA, but <clears throat> there is uh, no change in the lifetime with the addition of DNA. But in case of acridine orange, you can find that the single exponential 1.7 nanosecond component becoming bi-exponential, and this 1.7 nanosecond component lifetime increases with addition of DNA to 2.2 nanoseconds. So here, Radiative lifetime increases means non-radiative channels are blocked. So uh, acridine orange in presence of DNA can make a complex where radiation-less 
Chan channels are blocked and radiation lifetime is increasing. Okay. Now to verify this, we have used femtosecond up conversion technique, and we can find out the lifetimes of the order of femtoseconds. And it tells that these picosecond order lifetimes are increasing uh, of acridine orange is increasing in presence of DNA. Why? Because when acridine orange is coming towards DNA, the dynamically ordered water surrounding the DNA molecules are recognizing this molecule first. Okay. <coughs> and this molecule is being encapsulated by this dynamically ordered water molecule then uh, while it interacting with DNA. So this for this encap encapsulation, the non-radiative decay paths are uh, diminishing and radiative decay paths are increasing. Okay. And this type of interaction is also happening in case of other two. But there we can see two processes. One is electron transfer, another is encapsulation. But electron transfer is much more prominent than the encapsulation. So for acridine, acridine yellow, or proflavin, we cannot find this type of increase in radiative lifetime. But since acridine orange cannot do electron transfer with the DNA, it can show this type of uh, function of this dynamically ordered water molecule surrounding DNA. Okay. Uh, so now I will give you another example on carbon dots. That means nanomaterial. Now we have uh, synthesized uh, carbon dots, ruthenium carbon dots, just by digesting citric acid in presence of ruthenium. And this molecule uh, does not follow this kasha vabilov rule. That means this, the fluorescence of this molecule is excitation uh, like uh, wavelength dependent. Okay. Uh, but if we just aminated this molecule, then we can find out the excited, uh, excitation independent uh, fluorescence. Okay. From this molecule. Okay. Uh, and uh, now uh, we have, so we have uh, used these aminated carbon dots instead of original carbon dots. Now these carbon dots are linked with menadion uh, to see the uh, electron transfer process. We have linked menadion with these carbon dots. And, uh, and in one case and in another case, we have linked this menadion with these carbon dots uh, use, uh, with the intermediate homocysteine thiolactone uh, chains, okay? And uh, these are the diagrams of these uh, uh, two molecules. Here, menadine is linked directly with carbon dots, and here, menadine is linked with carbon dots with intermediate chain. The uh, donor acceptor distance here is 6.5 angstrom, and in this case, in the linked system, the distance is around 13.2 angstrom, okay? Now, you will find that compound with link chain is much more efficient uh, in fluorescence quenching or decreasing fluorescence lifetime. And so uh, we have tried to find out whether electron transfer is going on or not. So, and we have found that in case of link system, uh, the uh, stability or lifetime or yield of cation radical is much more compared to that uh, in case of unlinked system. So it tells that when the distance is around 6.5 angstrom between donor and acceptor, it is not an efficient electron transfer reagent. But when the distance between these two is around 13.2 angstrom, that means actually beyond 10 angstrom, this electron transfer between donor and acceptor uh, become efficient because there you can avoid the recombinations and electron transfer will be much more prominent than back electron transfer. Okay, now this process or this molecule can be used to sense quinone, excess quinone in the HeLa cell. If we use uh, this unlit system, we cannot do this experiment. But if we really want to sense or estimate excess quinone in the HeLa cell, we have to use uh, the link system, and the link system can help us to estimate this excess quinone in the cell. 
So I have told you about the some uh, basic aspects of photochemistry, which we can utilize to study the photochemical reactions using simple organic or inorganic molecules or biomicromolecules or uh, these nanomaterials. Okay. And uh, uh, lastly, I like to acknowledge uh, uh, my collaborators. For instrumentation, I should mention the names of Professor Dimnara Nath of Indian Association for the Cultivation of Science. He helped me a lot in fabric, uh, in experiments. And Chitra Raha, she helped my students in this to do this laser flash photolysis experiments. And Ajay Das, Sapun Pine, they have also helped me. And for synthesis, I like to thank Professor Manush Chakraborty, Professor Inar Pramik, Pramanik, and Dr. Kollal Bera. And for theoretical modeling, Professor Dhanunjay Bhattacharya, Professor Shagota Dashgupta, Dr. Uttam Pal. And for biological studies, Professor Patho Shah, Shampa Bishash, Dr. Oishi Chakraborty, and Dr. Chandima Dash. And for nanomaterials, I like to thank Professor Vishnu Shakraborty, Dr. Dulal Senapati, and Dr. Arnav Maithi. And I must thank all the members of my chemical sciences division of Shaha Institute of Nuclear Physics. And for funding, I have to thank Department of Atomic Energy India. Now, lastly, I like to thank all of my students because I think that these outcomes are for their sincere and hard work and their deep knowledge in chemistry and allied subjects. Okay, so now my students are here. You can see they are present uh, positions. And I last, uh, like, lastly, I'd like to thank all of you for your kind patience. Thank you again. Thank you, ma'am, for such lucid explanation of spectroscopy and uh, lasers and uh, the molecule DNA interaction. And uh, now I would like to request all the participants uh, to uh, give, uh, kindly ask any if you have any questions uh, directly to ma'am. Ma'am, I have a question. Yes, yes. In Lambert's Weir's law, we use very dilute solution. Yes. Why concentrated solution cannot be used? Achha. Okay. And now, you have asked me a very, very basic question. Achha. When you have read ideal gas and real gas, what is the difference between real gas and ideal gas? Uh, because uh, ideal gas has no uh, molecular attraction, intermolecular attraction. Huh. But in real gases, there are intermolecular attraction between the gas molecules. Etc. Similarly, if you, in case of dilute solution, you can think the dilute solution as an ideal solution. But yes. there is no interaction between two molecules. Okay? Molecules, uh, yes. But uh, in case of uh, concentrated solution, you cannot avoid, avoid that interaction. So you cannot find the linear equation. The equation will become non-linear because yes. pattern will come. Huh? So uh, the beauty of the lambert beers law uh, is here the, because this expression is a linear equation and from the slope of the straight line or etc., you can find out all uh, these extinction coefficients or unknown concentration, etc. So generally, this Lambert, in the case of Lambert's Weir's law, very, very dilute solution is used. If you use concentrated solution, then uh, this linearity will be hampered. Okay. Ma'am, another question. Yes. Uh, what is the photochemistry in dimerization reaction? Dimerization reaction. Very good question. Dimerization means, uh, I have no slides on dimerization, but I have a slide on exciplex, na? Okay, uh, with that slide, I can explain you. Um, okay, please, please wait for a minute. I am giving you that. Achha, you see, su suppose I have a pyrene molecule. Okay. Huh? Yeah, now, yeah. Say, say this is the spectrum of the pyrene, sorry, this is the spectrum of this pyrene fluorescence. Okay. Now, now when I am uh, going on, uh, I, I am going on uh, adding this uh, more, more, more and more, more and more pyrene molecules. Then pyrene molecule has conjugated pi bonding. Okay. Then one pyrene will stack with another pyrene and uh, through Van der Waals interactions. Through Van der Waals interactions. And this is called Xi-mar. That means dimer is forming in the 
excited state. And that will also give a fluorescence at the longer wavelength compared to the monomer pyrene. And th this type of mar, that means uh, 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 dimer formation, you can have in the ground state also. But since we are studying fluorescence, I can tell you this excimer is being formed in the uh, excited state uh, at higher concentration of the substance. And if the, uh, here, instead of pyrene, if I use dimethylanilin, then this pyrene and dimethylanilin will interact with each other and electron transfer will take place. And we can have this type of complex, charge transfer complex, which is termed as excitex. Now, what is difference between excimer and exciplex? In excimer, we have stacking between two pyrene molecules. So, if we just change the dielectric of the medium, there will be no change in the maximum wavelength of the fluorescence of this mark. But if it is exciplex where charge transfer is, uh, is happening, there, if we just change, if we just increase the polarity of the solvent, the wavelength, maximum wavelength of the complex will sh be shifted to the longer wavelength. Okay, so this is the difference between mar and <laughs> Okay. Ma'am, another question. What is the basic difference between the transient species in the photochemistry and activated complex in the transition state theory? Very good question. The questions are very good. You see, when we are studying chemical dynamics, <laughs> Jeet, mute yourself. Please, please mute, mute the. Please mute yourself. Jeet. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you. And now you can see uh, when we are studying this kinetics, we are telling that reactants, then activated complex, then products. Okay. So this yes. is the ground state phenomena. Okay, ground state phenomena. This activated complex, this is also transient. Yes. Because transient means short-lived species. You cannot find out the activated complex if you do the reaction in your laboratory. Okay. But if you uh, you can uh, identify that activated complex, if you just decrease or shorten your uh, time scale of your instrument. Okay. I mean, if you do the experiment in terms of, say, femtoseconds, then you can find uh, we know that hydrogen iodide uh, uh, dissociates to hydrogen and iodine. So in the activated complex, what will happen? A dot 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 I, that means there will be longer distance between, separation distance will be much more long uh, compared to the reactant uh, distance between hydrogen and iodide. This thing you can identify if you use femtosecond pulse. Okay. Uh, but for ordinary case, you cannot uh, find out this uh, a dot 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 i activated complex uh, using steady state instruments. Hmm. Similarly, the transients which I, which I have mentioned, these transients are being formed in the excited state. That means uh, we are exciting the molecules, molecules remain in the excited state, and they are now producing uh, the, uh, the, they are doing a, a, a chemical reaction and producing some, say, radicals, radical ions, which you cannot find by the steady state instruments. You have to find out those intermediates just by using short pulse speed. And so these are also transients, and your activated complex is also transient. But here, in case of activated complex, we are using ground state things. And for this one, for photochemistry, we are using excited state species. Now, uh, another question, ma'am. Uh, in the activated complex, there is a special type of vibration. But exactly. in, the in the transient state, in the photochemistry, is there any special type of vibration of the atoms or molecules? A very good, very good question. Because in the uh, uh, when you are doing ground state things, then in the activated complex, one vibrational modes is uh, 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 there will be uh, the number of vibrational modes uh, will be reduced by one. Nah? And that will help to uh, uh, have transitions of the activated complex to product side. 
But yes. uh, that that means, uh, but here you can see here these activated complex, these vibrational modes are not effective because that reaction is going on in the excited state where you are sitting in the lowest vibrational levels of the lowest excited single state. Okay, and that will uh, that may form an activated complex there. But the time scale will be sh so short that you cannot uh, find any instrument to measure it because uh, the maximum chemical reaction or chemical uh, times the, the chemical reaction with uh, say femtosecond you can measure. This is the lowest time scale and this is the time scale of electron transfer. Beyond femtosecond time scale. Uh, you cannot, that means you have to use auto second time instrument, but uh, that instrument, by that instrument, you cannot measure directly the electron transfer process or the formation of this radical species, etc., etc. So some activated complex may form, but we cannot find, uh, we cannot detect it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Another question. Uh, uh, the, uh, what is the use of phosphorescence in the biomolecules? Achha, what is the useful of phosphorescence? Because you see, triplet species uh, in biological molecules is a tryptophan estimation of nature of tryptophan. Uh, I did not uh, uh, do any instrument experiments with uh, these phosphorescence of these uh, tryptophan molecules. Uh, but uh, if you just follow the papers of Professor Shonjib Ghosh, please write, please write down the name. Uh, professor's name, Professor Shonjib Ghosh, of Presidency yes. College. You can find that. He did a lot of work uh, with this phosphorescence uh, to study the nature of tryptophan in the protein molecules. Okay. Yes. Uh, Ma'am, another question. Uh, in the uh, uh, CT complex, if we use anethyl carbazole mm. and crystal violet, instead of acrylene, we use the crystal violet. What will the basic uh, change will be there? Uh, you see, this exciplex formation uh, depends on different factors. You see, first of all, the singlet uh, interaction should be in singlet. Yes. Okay. Mm. Uh, now, if crystal violet energy gaps, and that means homolumo gap, I, I will show you this, one, this diagram. You can see in case of electron transfer, this uh, electron affinity and ionization potential of the donor acceptor is very important because yes. donor will donate electron, that means ionization potential, and acceptor will accept electron, that means this is the electron affinity. Electron. So when you will choose the proper donor and acceptor, the ionization potential, electron affinity, and electrostatic interaction should balance with each other to give delta G negative. Yes. Okay. So mm -hmm. I do not know what is the uh, what are the values of this uh, those values for crystal violet. So you have to try with crystal violet and to see whether it is happening or not. Ma'am, another question: uh, If a molecule can form hydrogen bonding, mm -hmm. hydrogen bonding, mm -hmm. then what will be the uh, effect in case of its photochemistry or in its fluorescence or phosphorescence behavior? Okay. 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 Hydrogen bonding uh, is very important in all chemistry, yes. similarly in photochemistry. You see, if, uh, if we uh, say, uh, uh, if we measure, say, fluorescence uh, of a molecule which has some charge transfer characteristics, and I am just increasing the polarity of the solvent, uh, I have told you that in case of exciplates, it is a charge transfer complex, and if I just increase the polarity of the solvent, then what yes. will happen? This charge transfer complex will be much more stable, and it will go to the longer wavelength. The peak will be shifted to the longer wavelength, and intensity will decrease because the separation product, that means ion pair, uh, free ion formation, will increase. Okay. Now yes. I have chosen two solvents. One is say acetonitrile, another is methanol. Okay. Yes. And the dielectric of methanol say around 36 and dielectric of acetonitrile say 37. Yes. More or less similar. More or less same. Huh? But in case of acetonitrile, we can find out the exciplex uh, luminescence at the longer wavelength to some extent. But in case of methanol, we cannot see the exciplex luminescence. Why? 
because in in case of ethanol ethanol can stabilize the exciplex by hydrogen hydrogen bond hydrogen bond and, and yes, yes. so that state becomes so much stabilized that the excited state and ground state vibrational levels are overlapped with each other okay yes. so mm. this radiationless process will be uh, much more prominent compared to that in case of acetonitrile so this is the role of hydrogen bonding uh, of water okay ma'am another question uh, uh sorry 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 to interrupt sir i know this is a very basic spectroscopy and basic very basic uh, topic to discuss and it can go on and on but since we are running uh, a little uh, behind the time so i will just stop this discussion over here itself and we can always contact ma'am directly any time she'll be available to answer our questions i hope and uh, so but since we have time constraints here so i think we should move on to our next speaker uh, at present and okay, later on okay. we can continue the discussion on this spectrum okay okay thank you momita yes and uh, thank you ma'am for such uh, lucid explanation of uh, basic spectroscopy and dna interactions and uh, of course you, you can very well see that it has intrigued uh, many the whole lot of uh, participants and uh, but we have to stop the discussion somewhere and in the webinar and i would request ma'am to be with us uh, till our poster sessions oral sessions and all and now i would like to uh, introduce our second uh, speaker of the day dr uh, teresa aditya and uh, Dr Aditya completed her BSc and MSc from Calcutta University in 2010 and 2012 respectively she then joined IIT Kharagpur for her doctoral research main research focus of her PhD involved the fields like the synthesis of noble metal fluorescent nanoparticles synergistic evolution of supported unsupported metal metal chalcogenite nanoparticles with tuned hierarchical morphology and facet synthesis of thin film by using liquid phase epitaxy using novel nanomaterial for water purification eradication of hazardous material etc in 2010 dr aditya started working in the radiation surface science and engineering laboratory nuclear engineering department pennsylvania state university united states of america during her postdoctoral research she has excelled in energy dispersive x ray spectroscopy iron beam irradiation atmospheric pressure plasma jet treatment cell immunostaining etc dr aditya has about 17 international peer reviewed publications till date with this brief introduction i request dr aditya to please proceed with her talk dr aditya please unmute yourself hello can you guys hear me yes yes we can thank you so much dr gangapadhyay for uh, the introduction uh, i am really honored to present my talk today in this uh, occasion of um, contribution of women scientists in academia and industry um i also feel privileged to share my research um till date with um, all the new research scientists and researchers a lot of women scientists as well with this i would uh, go into my topic of discussion today which is a nano the new world of possibilities i'm dr teresa ditya and i'm working as a postdoctoral scholar at penn state uh, i mainly work on nanomaterials so today my uh, discussion would be mainly on uh, what nanomaterial is what are their properties a general introduction of the classification the synth synthetic protocol their stabilization strategies uh the different characterization techniques that we use uh the growth mechanism of uh, nanoparticles their different shape size and morphology and their effect on the applications and uh, surface interaction and applications so we need to understand what is nanomaterial so nanomaterial can is any material which is in the in the dimension of 100 nanometer or less uh for for your uh, uh for your reference i've given a scale which kind of gives us a general view of nanomaterials of uh, what the scale of a nanomaterial is with respect to some of the known uh materials uh, that we know of and we see around the world nanomaterial were, uh, had been uh, one of the pioneers of uh, nanomaterial and work on nanomaterial was uh, richard feynman um he was a physicist who uh, who had given a beautiful talk 
of uh, which was like there's plenty of room at the bottom the title of the talk was and it was given in an american physical society meeting at caltech however nanomaterial is something which has which has existed for over centuries and lycurgus cup is one of the examples of such an such example of a nanomaterial where uh, due to the presence of silver and gold nanoparticles in the glass material the lycurgus cup looked green when it it, uh, it was uh, shown with reflected whereas transmitted light made it look red. What is the big deal about nanomaterials? So what are the different features that are very lucrative? They have a large surface area for any reaction. They have a very high surface energy. They are chemically more reactive. They have a tendency towards cell assembly and they have remarkable properties with respect to their bulk, with their bulk counterparts. Some of the features, some of the properties which are customizable are uh, in the nanoscale level with respect to their bulk counterparts are their mechanical properties, their optical properties, the porosity, their chemical stability, and various other different kinds of features like the band gap and um, the melting points. We also need to understand what is nanocomposites. So nanocomposites are materials which has more than one nanomaterial. And these nanocomposite uh, and their properties are highly dependent on the, on the properties of the constituent phases, the relative amounts, the shape, size, distribution of the nanoparticles, and interaction between the constituents that we are using. The different categories of nanomaterial that we come across and you guys must have read about are ceramic nanoparticles, carbon-based nanoparticles, metal nanoparticles, semiconductor nanoparticles, polymeric nanoparticles, lipid-based lipid nanoparticles. The different dimensions of nanoparticles that we will come across are zero dimension nanoparticles, which are like quantum dots, one dimensional nanoparticles, which are like nanowires. We will see morphologies which are nanowires, 2D uh, nanoparticles, which are nanosheets, um, and 3D nanoparticles, which uh, are uh, uh, nanoparticles which have a 3D geometry. Some of the synthetic techniques that we often use uh, involve both chemical processes and physical processes. These, uh, uh, some of these chemical processes I have listed here and the physical processes that are involved in synthesizing nanoparticles. But the two main characteristics are top-down and bot bottom-up method. Top-down method is, any met uh, is the method which uses a bulk material and it finally uh, crushes the material into smaller nanoparticles. Whereas bottom-up method involves uh, beginning with atoms and ions, and then finally agglomerating into nanoclusters, and finally nanomaterials. Uh, mechanical grinding, etching, lithography, these are some of the top-down methods, with, whereas gas phase agglomeration, molecular self-assembly, molecular beam epitaxy, these are some of the bottom-up methods, techniques of nanoparticle synthesis. Now, nanoparticles are very small, and we, as I have said about its features, they have a high surface energy. and uh, due to this, they have they often tend to agglomerate. So we need to find we want to keep the nanoparticles in their um, in their in a, in separate uh, entities as separate entities to get the best of the nanoparticles. So there are different st stabilization strategies like um, electrostatic stabilization, where uh, if the nanoparticles have the, have similar charges, then they would rep repel each other, and as a result, they would um, they would have their individual identity. There is electrostatic, uh, electrostatic um, stabilization where um, uh, different carbon chains are used along with some kind of um, uh, charges on the carbon chains uh, in order to form an electrost electrostatic kind of uh, stabilization. Again, solvent molecules are also often used as, uh, uh, like, uh, as a, as a uh, protective sphere again, the, again around the nanoparticles so that they can be uh, they can exist as uh, separate uh, entities. Also, polymeric materials are used for uh, um, as steric materials or for as depletion materials in order to uh, retain the individual uh, entity of the nanoparticles. Some of the characterization techniques that we will be using during um, after synthesis in order to understand the, the features of the nanomaterial, what kind of nanomaterial is, has been synthesized, um, are listed here. These are X-ray diffraction, through X-ray diffraction or XRD, as I will be mentioning it later on. Um, we can understand the composition, the surface property, the su crystalline structure, nature of the nanoparticles that we are trying to identify. 
Uh, the Fourier transform, uh, transform infrared spectroscopy and Raman spectroscopy are some of the tools that we use to understand molecular bonding. X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy uh, is something that we uh, is a is a te technique we use in, uh, to understand the surface oxidation state. The field emission uh, scanning electron microscopy and transmission electron microscopy are uh, tools we use to understand the size, shape, distribution. We get images which uh, which we can investigate in order to uh, understand what what kind of shape, what kind of um, uh, uh, what kind of nanoparticles and morphology has been synthesized. Energy dispersive X-ray uh, spectra are used uh, to understand the elemental distribution, what kind of elements are present in the compound. Thermogravimetric analysis helps us in understanding the different compounds that are present in the material. As it is heated, it is broken down into pa parts and we can, under we can uh, investigate the spectra to understand what compounds were present. bronner emmett teller analysis gives us an understanding of the surface uh, porosity, the uh, the porous structure, nature of the nanoparticles which has been formed. Zeta potential is a measure of the surface charge distribution of the nanoparticles. The different kind of applications that we will be seeing of nanoparticles um, that we see all the time um, around us in the world are uh, in catalysis and sensing, in fuel cell, in devices, energy so storage, a lot in biomedical application, environmental remediation, water splitting, and in uh, various different other uh, other spheres like paint industry, uh, medicine, pharmaceutical industries. And most of these nanoparticles and their efficiency depends on the shape, size, facet, uh, shape, size, and facets. So here I will be describing uh, some uh, research that I had been involved in and uh, the different kind of nanoparticles that, I, that, we are, we were, uh, that our team was involved in synthesizing and finally using them in different kinds of applications. So here is a surface modification of nanoparticle in different pH. In this work, we had used uh, nanoparticles of cuprous oxide. Here we synthesized cuprous oxide from uh, copper acetate and ethylene glycol and glucose. And in different pH, we observed that we, uh, we got different kinds of uh, morphology. So when it was basic, we uh, observed that we got octahedron morph morphology, whereas as, as we slowly in uh, increased uh, the acidity, uh, as we slowly made it neutral, we observed that there was dwarf hexapod structures, whereas when, the, when it was um, uh, done in, in acidic medium, the reaction was done in acidic medium, we observed that elongated hexapod structures of same cuprous oxide was observed. This is, uh, this is uh, a cube, cubic, uh, cube, cuprous oxide, cubic structures of cupro, uh, cuprous oxide. The basic crystalline structures of uh, structure of cuprous oxide is a uh, body-centered cube. And uh, the ethylene glycol acts as an etching agent, which uh, helps in the formation of these different morphologies. And the, due to the etching of 111 plane, as we see here, the uh, body-centered cube crystal, this 111 plane etching occurs in case of octahedron dwarf hexapod and elongated hexapod. And in all these cases, we see that we will later on see that the zeta potential or the surface positive charge is higher than that of cube. In cube, the number of copper, um, the copper atoms on the surface uh, is always less with respect to uh, with respect to a morphology where there has been etching on the 111 surface because there are more copper oxide. Uh, more copper atoms exposed with respect to that of a cubic structure. These are the different characterization techniques that we have used. Uh, XRD, which uh, proves that this is a uh, this is these are cuprous oxide nanoparticles. B BT analysis gives us uh, an understanding of the surface area of these nanoparticles. The FTI analysis uh, gives us an understanding of the molecular bonding of the copper and oxygen. The XPS analysis gives us an understanding of the uh, of the uh, oxidation state of the copper, as a result of which we can uh, establish that this is cuprous oxide. The zeta potential values uh, that we have observed uh, shows that octahedron uh, has the highest positive charges, whereas cube has the lowest positive surface charge. We further use this for different kinds of reactions like nitrophenol reduction and uh, chromium-6 reduction. Now, nitrophenol reduction is, uh, uh, is a reaction where uh, sodium borohydride is used, and this is in a basic medium. Now, due to the surface charge being positive in case of octahedron, this acted as a much better catalyst in case of, um, in case of this uh, particular reaction. 
uh, with nitrophenolic ions as the intermediate. Whereas in chromium-6 reduction, we see that uh, the cube gives a better, much better um, uh, reduction with respect to the octahedron because the number of, uh, because the surface charge uh, of the cube is much less than that of the octahedron. So here we get an uh, example of how the facets, how, how uh, the, due to etching of different uh, plane gives us different kinds of surface charge. And this results in different uh, catalytic efficiency of the nanoparticles. This is another example. This is an example of a nanocomposite where uh, we have incorporated uh, copper oxide nanoparticles on graphitic carbon nitride. This is a classic example of how uh, two two independent reactions have been uh, have been clubbed together in order to form a nanocomposite. With the help of um, with the help of uh, thermogrammetric analysis we could understand that uh, melamine structures forms condensation reaction and gives off ammonia and polymerizes into melam, melam, and finally graphitic carbon nitride, which are like nanosheet-like structures. These are two-dimensional nanosheet-like structures. Again, independent copper sulfate, um, heating independent uh, a copper sulfate, um, uh, copper sulfate, sulfate crystal would uh, uh, decompose it into cupric oxide and a part of this cupric oxide is reduced by the ammonia that is released from this reaction to form cuprous oxide. And this uh, this decomposition also releases sulfur trioxide. Now these two reactions when independently, uh, uh, these two independent reactions when combined together, we get a nanocomposite which has copper oxide deposition on graphitic carbon nitride. And there we also observe that the uh, the graphitic carbon nitride sheets have these porous structures. These porous structures basically uh, uh, occur due to the uh, evolution of sulfur trioxide, like sulfur oxide from the decomposition of copper sulfate. From the TG analysis, we beautifully understand how these different steps of uh, condensation reaction, um, the polymerization reaction, and the copper sulfate decomposition finally forms this um, nanocomposite of uh, copper oxide on graphitic carbon nitride. These are the SEM images and the TEM images, which gives us an understanding of the morphology. We also uh, have uh, further uh, characterized these materials, and we understood that uh, copper oxide, both cuprous oxide and cupric oxide is present, as well as the complete formation of graphitic carbon nitride was uh, achieved. The surface area uh, was uh, the surface area was investigated with BT analysis. The FTIR analysis gave, gave us an understanding of uh, the formation of copper oxide along with graphitic carbon nitride. These are the XPS analysis of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and copper, which uh, gives us an understanding that uh, definite copper oxide and cupric ox uh, cuprous oxide and cupric oxide has been synthesized from these from these peaks. We see that there is the peak of cuprous oxide, and these are the two satellite peaks of uh, these are the peaks of uh, cuprous oxide, and these are the two satellite peaks of cupric oxide. We have further used this, uh, used all these different kinds of nanomaterial, all these combinations uh, and different proportions of um, copper sulfate and graphitic carbon nitride, and we uh, used it for a catalysis of nitrophenol reduction. And we observed that uh, one of the compositions gave of uh, this copper oxide, uh, both cupric and cuprous oxide, incorporated on graphitic carbon nitride gave much better results with respect to just bulk cuprous oxide, bulk cupric oxide, and bulk graffiti carbon nitride, which also gives us an understanding of how the nanocomposites work when they combine together. These are the SEM images after um, the catalysis have been uh, uh, achieved. And we observe that uh, the copper oxide gradually gets reduced into cupric ox uh, into copper. This is another uh, another nanocomposite where uh, the um, uh, graphene oxide and uh, molybdenum sulfide had been synthesized as a nanocomposite with the help of um, uh, sodium dodecyl sulfate, which is a surfactant. So here, basically, the surfactant helped in the formation of these two um, two uh, molybdenum sulfide and graphene uh, and reduced graphene oxide to combine together and form a nanocomposite, which can give a better, much more efficient. Uh, catalyst. These are the SEM images. 
uh, where we see that sheet-like structures are formed and uh, the elemental mapping shows that uh, molybdenum and sulfide is uniformly distributed throughout the surface of the reduced graphene oxide. These are the EDS analysis uh, and uh, which gives us an understanding of the different elements that are present in the nanocomposite. The XRD analysis gives uh, give us an understanding <clears throat> of uh, the presence of molybdenum sulfide and the for um, and the formation of uh, reduced graphene oxide from graphene oxide. The FTR analysis also gives us an understanding of the molybdenum uh, sulfide uh, bonds uh, along with the formation of reduced graphene oxide. The XPS analysis uh, gives us an understanding of, of the presence of the different kinds of elements like molybdenum, sulf uh, sulfur, uh, copper, and oxygen. The Raman spectroscopy and the DG band of uh, graphene oxide is a unique way of understanding whether graphene oxide has been reduced into reduced graphene oxide. Uh, the, the ratio of the D and G band uh, proves that the formation of reduced graphene oxide was achieved successfully. Uh, the Raman spectroscopy also gives an understanding of the presence of molybdenum sulfide uh, due to these two peaks at 375 and 410 centimeter inverse. The beat analysis gives us an understanding of the large surface area that has been um, that has been achieved through this synthetic process. We then use this material in order uh, to do electrolysis of water, where uh, we get hydrogen evolution. So this so this this catalyst could be used as a uh, in, in order to uh, efficiently do hydrogen evolution reaction and further use use these kind of materials in fuel cell uh, applications. So these are again uh, a comparison of the different kind of uh, uh, of the different um, uh, components that has been used in the formation of nanocomposites. So we have independently used graphene oxide, we've used molybdenum sulfide separately, and then we use different kinds of uh, uh, different kinds of uh, surfactant like CTAP, PVP, and SDS. And we finally observed that it was only the SDS. Uh, combination along with molybdenum sulf uh, along with uh, molybdenum sulf sulfide and the graphene oxide that gave the best kind of catalyst. This is another uh, na nanocomposite formation where we have seen that light irradiation influences the morphology of the nanoparticle. Uh, here we observe that when we use ethanol and benzophenol in presence of UV, we get the unique nanodendritic structure, which is not a very common structure for palladium. Palladium nanoparticles are mostly um, um, like uh, mostly triangular or pentagonal shape. But uh, when we use benzophenol in presence of UV, we observe that uh, unique nanodendritic structures are formed. Now, this has been explained again uh, uh, with, uh, by the fact that when, uh, it, uh, when benzophenone is used in presence of UV, uh, they can act as initiators. And when a, a nucleation of the palladium nanoparticle occurs, the benzophenone goes and attaches itself, forming these channels through which the fur further nucleation occurs and finally gives the nanodendritic structure. These are the different kinds of characterizations that we have done. Uh, we have done XRD and FTIR in order to understand uh, the, the in order to understand that palladium has been uh, uh, palladium has nucleated on the surface of these graphene oxide uh, of these reduced graphene oxide, uh, and from the beat analysis we understand that uh, the nanodendritic structures the the nano uh, nanocomposite formed with nanodendritic palladium has a higher surface area with respect to the nano triangles. The XPS analysis gives us an understanding that pal palladium has been uh, incorporated into the reduced graphene oxide. This has been further used in Suzuki coupling reaction, and it was a uh, and it was uh, studied that uh, only the nanodendritic structure gave the best kind of catalytic uh, efficiency with respect to nano uh, nano triangles and, and nano pentagons and nano rectangular structures. So uh, this is also an example of how the the shape morphology of nanoparticles uh, highly affect the efficiency uh, their efficiency in a chemical reaction. Uh, next, I would like to uh, uh, deviate a little from the catalytic point of view and um, go into tissue engineering and using materials for different kinds of biomedical applications. Uh, here we uh, we uh, study the interaction of plasma with uh, nanomaterials. So first we need to understand what is plasma. Plasma is the fourth state of matter 
and uh, just like uh, solid transfers into liquid, then it uh, transforms into gas. Gas can transform into plasma. Uh, the most uh, live example of plasma would be lightning, where uh, uh, these plasma particles this, um, uh, is formed uh, in the clouds, and the electrons can uh, like literally travel through thin air and reach the ground, and we know what lightning is and how it affects the surface of Earth. We have used this uh, big picture in, and brought it into the laboratory and we uh, formed these ion sources where we have the plasma, uh, plasma source of uh, both inert as well as reactive gases. And we use these ion sources uh, to irradiate, it, ir irradiate, it, irradiate the surface of materials. So uh, this, uh, as, as these plasma, uh, plasma ions uh, hit the surface of materials, there is a dynamic change on the surface of the material. The atoms and the uh, the atoms on the surface rearrange, and often there are defects formed, or there is rearranging and disorientation of the atoms on the surface. Also, there is formation of nano patterning. Now, these highly affect the their efficiency. the The ion also uh, the the different the dif uh, the technique of plasma irradiation has different parameters like the gas species, the fluence the angle of incidence, the energy of the incident ions, which affects the surface of the materials that we are um, treating it with. We have used this these kind of nanomaterial, nanopatterning and a surface uh, disorientation of the, uh, of the uh, materials. And uh, we observed that different kind of uh, nanopatterning has occurred, as well as there is different chemical compositional changes which finally uh, affects their efficiency. These materials have been used uh, to check the live and dead cell, uh, dead assay of bacterial cells. And it was observed that those materials which were irradiated with plasma and had a compositional change uh, showed uh, less affinity towards bacterial growth uh, with, respect to, uh, uh, with respect to materials which were not treated. And then when we use this uh, further for um, addition of mesenchymal stem cells, we observed that those materials which had a surface nanopatterning along with change in, uh, along with change in the composition of the atoms on the surface, they showed a better cell addition with respect to those which were untreated. These mesenchymal stem cells are further, uh, they further pro proliferate and can uh, develop into uh, bone tissues or skin tissues and can be used in different kind of bone fractures, skin repair, burn repair, and dental implants. So this is uh, the total concept of the kind of research that I'm doing. And uh, I would like to thank and uh, thank and acknowledge my supervisor, Jean-Paul Alain uh, at Penn State. And uh, this is of, these are a few members of my group. Um, thank you all for your attention. And I would like to uh, take on any questions that you all have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aditya. I mean, I think what it's uh, around 1.30 uh, in the night there. Uh, yeah, it's 1.30. Uh, so, 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 so thank you for staying up all night almost for us, for attending no this worries. webinar. It was a pleasure. I, was, I, I really feel privileged that I could share my research with all the <laughs> upcoming and new <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for explaining in detail the synthesis and characteristic and more important the application of nanomaterials. And now I'll open the uh, session. If uh, anybody has any questions, can just directly ask uh, Dr. Aditya. Ma'am, one question. Is there a difference between the colloidal particles and nanoparticles? Yes. So colloidal particles are actually much smaller. Like they are in the... Uh, in a very low nanometer level, like one, one or two nanometers or maybe five nanometers, they would form colloidal particles. But uh, the nanomaterials, which are like around more than 50 or like more than like 50, 40, 50, they would show nanomaterial. They, that we would be calling as nanomaterial. Now, what is the, what type of chemical reaction undergo the nanoparticles? Um, what type of? Chemical reaction undergoes the nanoparticles. So nanoparticles can be synthesized with uh, uh, like using very low concentration of materials. Like you cannot expect 
yeah, you cannot use bulk materials or in like gram scale level of materials and expect nanoparticles, usually very dilute solutions or very low mo uh, molecular, uh, like molar solutions, are, uh, low concentration solutions are used for synthesis of nanoparticles. Now, how stability of the nanoparticles can be achieved? So, uh, as I had uh, described in one of the uh, slides, that uh, different kind of stabilization strategies are used for uh, for st uh, stabilizing nanoparticles. So, we uh, often see the nanoparticles have a surface charge that can uh, help them to keep uh, themselves apart and like as uh, individual identity and, and have their individual identity. They, there can be steric effect. Uh, there can be solvation effect uh, of uh, the solvent molecules. Uh, these are some of the like be, uh, like common techniques that we use uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to keep the nanoparticles in their like uh, separate uh, as separate uh, entities. One question: Is there any term nanocomplex? Uh, nanocomplex. You can uh, uh, describe something as nanocomplex. Like I would say that one of in one of my uh, work uh, in this work we had like the copper nano what we had uh, proposed was the copper uh, uh, the copper nanoparticles which are formed forms amine complex so we could call that as a nano complex so copper amine yes. complex which lowers down the activation energy of the thermal like activation energy for the thermal decomposition we see the thermal decomposition of copper sulfate at much lower temperature with respect to normal copper sulfate decomposition okay ma'am thank you yeah, I have one question about nanoparticles. Yes. Uh, Madam, first of all, you thank you uh, very much for your valuable comments. And uh, my question about nanoparticle is, are there any specific health or other risks from nanoproducts? Uh, so uh, I would I would say there there are, if you use the nanoparticles in wrong way or handle it in, long, in the wrong way, it can have adverse effects in your health. Uh, so, uh, as we do here, when we work on nanoparticles, we have to have a SOP, like a, uh, like how we are going to uh, be working with nanoparticles. We should not inhale it. If, if they are dry powders, we should, not in, we should not be inhaling it. Unless you're deliberately taking a nanoparticle as a medical uh, solution, as a medical prescription, um, it is definitely a, a harmful thing because they are very high. They have a very high surface energy. They are, they're very reactive, so they can go into your body and it can have adverse effects. Ma'am, one question. Uh, what is the term nanogel? Uh, nanogel? Yes. Uh, uh, I, I think if nanoparticles, like often nanoparticles are used to uh, make hydrogels. So na like uh, gel formation is possible with nanoparticles. There are lots of reports of nanoparticle forming gels. So I think those can be termed as nanogels. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Why gold is mostly used in nanoparticles? Uh, a lot of uh, actually materials are used in nanoparticles. I think you've read a lot of gold nanoparticle papers. Um, but also gold is a is a hugely is a widely used nano material. Is a widely used nanoparticle because it's inert. It can be used in drug delivery and uh, like it's it's non toxic in in terms of uh, like safety with. Uh, with uh, like the safety of the body. So I think a lot of gold nanoparticles are used in different products because of its inertness and its, and its safety while using it. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, one question. What is the light effect of the nanoparticles? What is the? Light effect. So uh, there can be different optical property changes, like, uh, there, like optical properties can change uh, uh, when a particle is bought from from the bulk material to the nano level uh, or or as or, or made a nanoparticle, so basically the optical what we see in Likergas cup is all is a form of light effect or is a form of optical property change. So when these gold and silver uh, colloidal particles, which is present in the glass, they reflect light. They show green in coloration, whereas when they are transmitting light, they show red coloration. So I think optical property, uh, like there could be a, a I mean, I, I'm sure there are a lot of other optical properties than this no, basic one that I'm describing. Now, why why there will be a color change? So it is uh, it is the how the light is transmitted 
through these particles like what uh, since due to the presence of these nanoparticles in the in the glass material the way the light will be transmitting through them is going to is definitely going to be different uh, uh, if it was uh, uh, with respect to a, a glass which has no such uh, impurities in the material okay thank you <clears throat> okay, so if there are no more questions, uh, let us thank Dr. Aditya for uh, sharing her research work with us and uh, spending her valuable time with us and hope we have her again with us in some times in future. And uh, so thank you, Dr. Aditya, again. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me for this talk. It was really lovely to talk uh, about my research work with all the upcoming uh, research scientists and I would be waiting for uh, to see more researchers and a lot of women researchers in this in this field and I will be waiting to work with them as like colleagues. Yes, for sure, for sure. That is what we thank look you. up to always and that is what the uh, this webinar is all about. Right. Thank you so much. Yes. So thank you. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. So let us just move towards our uh, next speaker. So keeping with our theme, uh, the second resource person of the day is someone who has more than 10 years of experience in the industrial sector, Ms. Konkona Pal. After graduating from New Alipur College, Kolkata in 2009 with chemistry honors, Ms. Paul obtained her master's degree in the year 2011 from Rajabaja Science College. Soon after her master's, she joined Chitranjan National Cancer Institute, Bhavanipur, to pursue her research career. However, it was in the year 2012 that she found her true calling and joined the Walker Metro Chemicals Private Limited as an R&D chemist executive. There, she was vigorously involved in synthesizing new silicon-based polymers. In 2019, she shifted from synthesis to the more application-oriented textile sector of her company. Within just 10 years, she has achieved remarkable milestones in her career and become the assistant manager of Walker Metro Chemicals Private Limited, Kolkata. Without further delay, I now request Ms. Konkona Pal to kindly share her experience with us. So good afternoon, everyone. I hope I'm audible to all of you. Yes, yes. You are. Okay. okay. So uh, it's my honor today to be here. And I would like to thank, thank the organizers for inviting me to share my journey as a R&D personnel in Waka Metro Chemicals Private Limited. So as today we are celebrating International Women's Day, it's our pleasure or I would like to be highly, uh, I am, mm, sorry. So uh, I'd like to enlighten on the topic that in today's world, women are, uh, successfully putting a step forward in every field actually and taking up challenges, crossing the hurdles and uh, crossing the hurdles and contributing in the growth of the society. So before starting or before uh, starting about my work, before starting about my work, I would like to give a small uh, introduction about my company or my uh, organization. It's a, a JV between Walker, Walker Shemi AG, whose headquarters is actually situated in Munich, Germany, and uh, Metro Chemicals Private Limited, which was started by Mr. Shoraz Ranjan Mukherjee back in 1970s. And in 1998, the JV happened between Walker Shemi AG and Walker Metro. And now it's a uh, total, in India, it's Walker Metro, Metro Chemicals Private Limited. So Wakar Shemi has different manufacturing sites all over the world, including Germany, uh, USA, Japan, and Brazil. And in Kolkata, specifically in Amtala also, we have a uh, production site. And uh, other than the uh, manufacturing site in Kolkata, we uh, have different facilities here. Mainly, we have a specific R&D center here, and then we have uh, QC facilities, we have logistics, and um, we have NMR facility also. And in every department, women, uh, my women colleagues are contributing for the growth of the company. So from start, now we mainly work with silicon here. Now uh, it's a very important topic or it's a very important or interesting element to work with. 
in nature silicon is not obtained in its purest form starting from basically sand it can be converted in such versatile uh, versatile compounds that is hard to imagine for example as we can say if we think about the fabrics we are using today the soft feel which we uh, get from that fa fabric is basically due to silicon and if we think about the shampoo or the conditioner that we are using in our daily life the smooth silky feeling that we are getting in our hair or our skin is also due to silicon from foam enhancer to foam reducer silicon can act as both and i can also say you that from automotive industry to the baby nipples to the insulation silicon act everywhere and day by day as we are seeing that application of silicon is actually increasing it's a very versatile molecule and we can work in different fields with silicon and one more thing i must mention that silicon is a safest polymer it has it is non hazardous i mean uh, it's very much safe to hair because otherwise baby nipples can't be made from silicon so it's a very important uh, or um, interesting element to work with i'm working with it for last 10 years and i'm still learning about it but uh, as per my experience or knowledge it's a very important or segment in our daily to daily life so as i said that silicon is not obtained in the environment in its purest form it's mainly found in the form of sand and as you know that from silica uh, silica we need carbon reduction to convert it to the purest silicon form that is the silicon metal that we found find here is obtained from the silica that is basically sand by the carbon reduction process it requires a lot of energy and the process temperature is almost 2000 degree centigrade it's a very energy uh, energy it requires a lot of energy plus it requires a lot of capital too not many companies in the uh, world manufacture silica uh, silicon from silica but fortunately worker has its own plan and we manufacture uh, silicon from the basic silica and then in our german plant or other manufacturing sites we convert this basic silicon metal to this di this dichloro dimethyl dichlorosilane i will explain how from silicon metal we use muller rosho process to convert the basic silicon metal to this usable dimethyl dichlorosilane we require around 300 degree temperature for this process in presence of copper catalyst and methyl chloride we use in this step and mainly 70 to 90% of this dichloro dimethyl silane is produced and the other products in this steps are say trichloro methyl silane and the other one that mean trimethyl monochloro silane but the major 70 to 80% product is this one and after the hydrolysis of this product we convert it to the hydroxy terminated organosilane oligosilane or you can say from silicon the silanes are produced now in india we mainly work with these silane molecules or the we convert this silane molecule into different polysiloxanes we increase the chain length of the silanes and by different organo modification of this molecule we convert it to different silicon fluids which have different applications in different field for the last 8 years of my uh, career in the synthesis team i was working with this portion only i was working with this silanes this polysiloxanes and organo modified silicon fluid what we were doing we were uh, working with this basic pdms or polysiloxanes moiety and with different uh, different organic moiety we were modifying the molecule so that it can goes in different applications and now my work of interest is with those as those polymers are not directly usable we convert those polymers to usable silicon emulsions we emulsify them and those emulsions directly goes in your shampoo or in your conditioner in your soap in your sunscreen etc 
So, silicon has different applications in textile industries, in construction industry, chemical industry, in rubber industry, in consumer care mainly, also in um, paper coating release as release agents. But in uh, WMC, we mainly work in the consumer care, construction, chemical industry, textile, and rubber. So first, I will explain a little bit about the use of silicon in silicon consumer care. So the main ingredients which gives the small, uh, smooth, soft filling in your hair is because of silicon. It goes in your shampoo, in your conditioner, and in all those serums that we use today in today's life, the silky smooth filling comes basically due to silicone. And also nowadays in your skincare products like your night cream, in your sunscreen, or in your BB creams, everywhere the use of silicone is increasing because the soft silky touch that silicone gives on your body or in your skin is unparalleled. Now, uh, there is also a use of uh, silicone in the laundry industry that I told you it can act as a foam enhancer or reducer. So, in, uh, I will just briefly explain about one of my projects that, uh, that was first assigned to me when I joined in back 2012. It was a global project with Unilever. It, uh, act, as we know that uh, day by day, we, uh, the use of water, we are trying to reduce the use of water in, um, so that we can preserve it. But as we know, when we hand wash our clothes, there is a wastage of uh, water during the rinsing cycles. So uh, the main motto or the main uh, goal of the project was that we have to reduce the amount of water use during the rinsing processes or the rinsing cycles. So the first, uh, that was a global project uh, of Waka Metro Art with Unilever mainly. So I worked on this uh, project. It was my first project. And what we did, we did just basically we modified the silicon backbone moiety with different functional groups. So that when it, it goes in the detergent, it first, it must not hamper the uh, washing, uh, washing technique or it's um, the lathering processes. It will not hamper anything. But during the rinsing cycles, when we use water to wash our clothes or wash the foams, it will act and uh, reduce the use of water in the rinsing cycles. So as I can say that it was a, uh, it was a successful project for us between Wacker and Unilever and Unilever globally launched this project, project um, all over the world. And in India also, they launched this uh, compound or the, our silicon polymer in um, in wheel brand and this our that polymer also got patented for water. So that was the use of silicon mainly in the consumer care industry, mainly hair care, skin care or the laundry industry. Now what I am uh, doing now my last three years experience is in silicon textile industry. So from, from very basic I can say that what uh, if from in daily life the shirt we are using or the denim we are using, everywhere you are using silicon because the smooth feeling or the wrinkle fee feeling or the guffness or the bounciness in a towel which we get in everyday garments or anything or what I say it's blanket, it may be curtain, it may be bed sheets. Silicon is used everywhere. It is used in cotton, in polyester, in today's viscose that is regenerated cotton, which we are using in today's life. Silicon is uh, applying everywhere. We can make the fabric hydrophilic, hydrophobic according to our requirement, but without silicon, no garment or textile finish is possible. In every industry in India, in Bangladesh, we are supplying silicon chemicals for the final finishing. In anti-foam industry also, there are so many uh, industry, although I'm not working directly in this uh, segment, but from my knowledge, uh, as I know, that there are different industries where uh, there, there are uncontrollable foam which generates during processing, which is at all not desirable. 
but using but just using a few drops or few ppm of silicon you can destroy that um, foam and that is very much essential or beneficial for our industrial point of view so our colleagues are working on silicon and as uh, silicon anti foam agents also in wakan metro arc we have a vast um, business on silicon rubber as we can see from the pictures that nowadays silicon is used in um, mold making molds i mean chocolate molds ice cream molds that baby nipples the bands you are using in today's life or the goggles everywhere there is use of silicon because these silicons are non hazardous to your skin they are very safe they are heat resistant so you can use it easily in today's life now there is silicon release agent also for mold releasing we are also using silicon and i must say that uh, i must name some few global brands which are associated with wacker for last 20 30 years are mainly unilever l'oreal rekit ben kaiser procter and gamble kevin care those are in, those are mainly linked with personal care industry in textile industry they are zara h&m adidas nike Reliance Chemicals also is our uh, key customer, and I must uh, mention one more thing: that Patanjali is also our customer. So they are also using silicon in their skincare and hair care products. So this was a brief, brief, uh, brief um, uh, about my work that we were doing uh, with our Metro Chemicals. But at the end, uh, I would must I would like to. Uh, i would like to encourage every student or everyone who is hearing me that as per my concern women are doing very well in every sector i am personally uh, in a industry so i must say that in industry we also get a chance to do some research work and uh, do it commercially basically what we do in uh, in a industrial scale we have to um i mean in i if i give an example in textile what i'm doing today we have also we always have a pressure to deliver it to the customer mainly within two or three months if there is a customer requirement we have to do some research on that and deliver it within two and three months so or for not only two and three months for unilever or l'oreal projects we get four five years also so industry is also good option as a good career option if you think about it and we uh, you can do research work here also you can do your phd and can join our organization there is also a opportunity for all of you and it's uh, i must say that industry is also a very safe environment to work because i have said uh, as per my experience i can uh, sh share with you that there is zero discrimination in terms of um, opportunity growth or remuneration because if a male colleague of mine gets an opportunity to visit a customer or get a trial i get that equal opportunity there is no discrimination in an industry between a male colleague or a female employee so there is zero discrimination between colleagues and moreover that here we they they first uh, our safety is their first priority our in our organization against the sexual harassment in workplace they conduct a very strong and active post committee is there they after the also the uh, after the need, tragic nirbhaya case they organized several self defense training for us and in a several uh, time gap in a regular time gap they organize different training programs which are designed for our mental mental health or our self Uh, self development programs are organized for us in our industry and when almost 20% of our total strength represent female employees and from starting from sales to the r&d to the production qc qa logistic female employees are everywhere even our uh, vp finance uh, is a female employee and she is uh, on not only she but all of us are working together or shoulder to shoulder with other colleagues and contributing in the growth of our company so i would like to encourage all of you all of um, the students who can
take or think about uh, industry as a career option can because i think we can take all type of challenges and excel in every place where we work thank you thank you kankuna i think you have managed to inspire a whole lot of our students who are looking for a non academic uh, job option uh, after their graduation or masters and i think that the the way you have portrayed the safety uh, in safe environment of your company as well so they might get even more motivated now with this i would like to open the session for a few questions maybe sure one question can silicon polymer can be used as a anti inflammatory agent yes in text uh, in technical textile although as in wmc we don't work till now we don't work in textile technical textile but we are planning to do so but it uh, can be used different silicon polymer are used in anti inflammatory uh, um, purposes but as uh, as of now we are not working on that field but we have plans now what is the polymer of silicon that is silicones what is silicone silicon okay. yeah silicon is the basic metal and when we actually the silicon when we convert it as i told you by the muller rosho process when we convert it to silicon oxygen silicon oxygen bond then we can call it silicon that is s i l i c o n e uh, one second i have okay i have cross uh, uh, i have just uh, in my presentation but the basic the metal is silicon s i l i c o n but when we convert it to sio sio bond that is called the silicon polymer and with that silicon polymer actually we work here we differently modify that molecule and those organo modified molecules goes in different application not the basic silicon now why silicon is utilized in many of the synthetic products what is the uh, reason behind that as i told you that although it's a basic silicon oxygen silicon or oxygen bond is a basic thing what is silicon is a basic thing but when we uh, introduce different molecule different organic moieties or different functionalities in it it acts magically for example if i introduce amino groups it gives a different hand feel on fabrics if i introduce different eopo groups it will give hydrophilicity on fabrics so by modifying that moiety we can apply it in various applications so in today's world it it has gained its popularity and you can think up for consumer care textile industry it can't think about um, it doesn't work without silicon everywhere will find the silicon also there is that there, there is a topic of so I, i must uh, consider that uh, i must acknowledge that there is a topic of uh, silicon free paraben free shampoo conditioner there is a topic of talking about that but none of the industry has been able to totally discard silicon till now and in textile mainly you can't think about silicon without silicon because without silicon you don't get the feel or the hand feel you get in your towel or in your blanket the soft feeling that you get in your blanket or in your fabrics you will not get that without silicon you can't do anything without silicon textile industry or in personal care till now in rubber industry also is there any industrial use of polysiloxane everything in the the basic polysiloxane that i told you that the silicon what you i told you initially that's sio sio bond the linkage that is the polysiloxane the basic pdms the we modify that pdms into different molecules and with the, the that is the main uh, the backbone of the uh, silicon industry we use that basic pdms and uh, convert into different um, molecules and moieties and uh, and apply them in different industries that is the basic uh, backbone polysiloxane okay yeah. thank you okay so if there are no more questions let us thank uh, miss pal uh, for taking her time out and i think she is still in the office and she has joined yeah. us from office itself uh, so let us just uh, release her from uh, this webinar and uh, let her work uh, so thank you uh, miss pal once again uh, for motivating our students to avail a career in uh, industry and thank you once again and hope to have you with us in future as well
thank you uh, thank you, you also thank you the organizers for for inviting me because i'm still learning i'm gathering my knowledge in silicon industry but i got the opportunity to share my experience with all of you so thanks for that thank you thank you thank you okay so with this we'll just uh, move to our second technical session uh, which is the uh, poster or oral presentation session and uh, now uh, there is a small announcement uh, now since we have uh, been overwhelmed with a huge number of responses for oral as well as poster presentations so we have actually had to uh, cut short the time of the presentations like uh, for now we will have a 8 plus 2 segment for 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 the oral presentation like 8 minutes of presentation and followed by 2 minutes of uh, discussion and uh, for poster presentation that would be 5 uh, plus 2 minutes um, Uh, of uh, the total presentation and uh, i think uh, and if there are any questions you can just post it in the chat box or raise your hand and we can discuss it after the presentation and so without further delay i would now like to request professor somit shomita basu uh, to kindly preside over the second technical session thank you omita for giving me this opportunity now i like to start uh, this session just now okay and the first speaker is dr bishwajit panda he is the assistant professor department of chemistry city college and he will talk on mimicking dna proofreading and repair for stereo specific synthesis of cyclopropene polymer uh, stromaphane okay uh, dr panda please go ahead Doctor Panda, are you here? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, my yes. my my uh, screen is visible. The screen is visible means uh, you are showing. Uh, yes, 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 yes. Now okay. it is. Okay, 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 okay. okay. So, uh, thank you. No, no, um, no, 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 no. Please. Uh, huh? uh, now your screen is not visible fully. Uh, this one, but you have to make it bigger. Is it okay? No, no. You please. Uh, Uh, expand the slides this is very narrow slides oh. you can see uh, i think this is okay this is okay but it is smaller in size you can uh, dr panda can you can you just uh, rotate your screen uh, the, the mobile screen just rotate screen and then it will be okay. fine okay it's okay yes, yes. Uh, this, is, this is okay this okay. Is okay 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 thank you uh, i will time will start now okay okay Mm-hmm. so th- thank you very much for uh, giving me this opportunity to uh, present my uh, uh, work uh, in front of uh, various uh, dignitaries and the uh, students so the topic of my uh, today's oral uh, presentation is the mimicking uh, dna uh, proof reading and repair of stereo specific synthesis of cyclopropene polymer that is the stromaphane stromaphane is a a uh, new type of two dimensional covalent organic framework is constituted of multiple layers of ladder fans where two adjacent ladder fan motifs that share a common polymeric backbone so uh, like the dna when uh, some dna is uh, ruptured and it can repair um, so similarly uh, this polymers uh, that name as the stromaphane that can repair it itself so it, it's uh, self Uh, repairing or um, polymers so that that today uh, we are going to discuss about this uh, about the stromaphane and before that uh, since uh, most of the uh, students and this type of seminars are basically uh, for students i'm not going to discuss about details uh, about the some uh, polymeric uh, uh, the research work but i'm just uh, discuss about the little bit of uh, in 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 surface so so i think uh, everybody knows the olefin metathesis here uh, two olefins are 
in presence of say ruthenium uh, catalyst or say molybdenum catalyst, uh, Graves catalyst or shock catalyst, it can you know exchange so it exchange the uh, olefin position. So uh, and uh, this is the olefin metathesis, and this olefin metathesis techniques are useful for the uh, ring opening metathesis polymerization that is the uh, ROMP uh, reaction. So generally, the metathesis catalysts are the Graves one, Graves two, and uh, Saavedra Graves, Sox, and the Sox Saavedra catalysts are used in uh, ring opening metathesis polymerization reaction. So previously, uh, in 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 uh, laboratory, uh, the norbonin containing and the cyclobutene containing uh, monomers unit are used to prepare this uh, polymer uh, using this ROMP method. My uh, target and uh, this type of uh, polymers are formed. And my target is to uh, apply these techniques uh, to uh, in, in case of cyclopropene compound. And um, you may know that the cyclopropene is highly strain compound and its strain energy or uh, ring strain is, is 228 kilojoule per uh, mole. And thus the uh, electronic environment, if you consider this vinylic carbon, which actually we expect the vinyl carbon is sp2, but it is sp1.19. And what is the sp3 actually that this center is actually sp2.68. So due to the strain, the electronic environment of the cyclopropene is, is dramatically changed from the normal aliphatic compounds. Oh. Okay. So the uh, synthetic uh, strategy for the cyclopropene is basically, first of all, if you consider uh, to synthesis a cyclopropene, you need to prepare a double bond uh, from the using the uh, say maybe vitic uh, olefination and then the uh, dibromo compound that is the cyclodibromo uh, propanation using this uh, dibromo carfene addition and then uh, reduction and followed by elimination of the HBr produce this cyclopropene derivative. So, but this cyclopropene derivative is, is, is perhaps some tacticity problem. You can uh, see here, one is the benzene ring, another is the methyl ring. So, similar to this previous work, I, am, uh, I plan that to prepare this nitrogen containing compound. And nitrogen is basically important here because uh, the polymer shows for uh, photophysical uh, activity. If nitrogen is there, then its activity is enhanced. So uh, to uh, continue this the previous uh, six member and five member, uh, five member and four member, uh, we are planning to synthesize these three member cyclopropene derivatives. Now this simple small molecules is, is not easy to synthesize because you can see here the spiro compound is there and a cyclopropene double bond is there and a spiro compound and containing a nitrogen containing four member ring is there. So highly strained and since this strain is there, and the other chemistry is not similar as the you know uh, the normal reported uh, procedure. So a lot of difficulties, and the, uh, ultimately we have succeeded. So that story we are going to discuss about here. So the uh, strategy is uh, first this dibromo carboxylic acid that uh, converted to the uh, acid chloride using the oxalyl chloride, and then uh, using this bromoaniline uh, we have prepared that uh, amide. And then in presence of the phase transfer catalyst and 50% NOH solution, uh, ultimately we, we have obtained this four-member beta-lactam compound uh, with a uh, double bond. Here, interestingly, if you use a strong base for this amide formation, since the alpha proton is there in, in, case of, in, compound, in case of compound eight, so in case of compound eight, um, that uh, since, sorry, not eight, it's five. Yeah, uh, my, my eyesight is not good. So, um, so the compound five uh, is uh, containing a acidic proton, alpha to the carbon, uh, the carboxylic acid. So it, it can uh, it can uh, form the ketene. That's why I use the uh, aniline in two equivalent. One aniline act, acting as a uh, nucleophile, and another is a uh, base. So after this uh, beta lactam um, formation. Uh, the target is to reduction of the beta lactam, the uh, carbonyl beta lactam, uh, to the say azetidine type derivatives. So this reduction is not easy. When you use the dival or a lithium aluminum hydride um, or say borane, the generally uh, it uh, gives this um, ring opening product. Uh, so uh, you can see here in compound uh, compound nine is the ring opening uh, product. So to obtain this uh, four member uh, compound, that is uh, a compound eight. Compound H, but I use alum lithium aluminum hydride in place of aluminum trichloride. That aluminum trichloride actually coordinates the oxygen, and um, the reduction is uh, you know facilitated 
uh, by this lone pair of the nitrogen that is the ngp type pathway and ultimately reduction of this um, uh, immunium salt to produce this azitidine and then uh, this n butyl lithium mediated uh, bromo lithium exchange and uh, carboxylation using the carbon dioxide gas and ultimately then the esterification provide this uh, ester compound 12 but interestingly when uh, according to the previous uh, slide when we use uh, this dibromo uh, carbene instead of dibromo uh, carbene for the cyclopropane it uh, it did not work it's actually open up this reaction to form the informal di derivative so to uh, overcome this uh, failure uh, what i uh, modified this process as uh, if you use the bromo forms and uh, in presence of base it 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 can uh, ultimately react as a michael addition and followed by uh, reverse um, cyclization to form the dibromo uh, cyclopropane and then uh, reduction of the dibromo to monobromo and then this monobromo to the elimination reaction in presence of potassium tetrabutoxide uh, to provide this uh, cyclopropene derivative and then using the palladium catalyzed um, um, reaction using carbon monoxide and methanol uh, we can convert this bromo compound to the carboxylic acid uh, and then carboxylic ester and then hydrolysis of the carboxylic ester Uh, it provide the carboxylic acid so this is the total uh, schematic diagram of the formation of the uh, cyclopropene monomer now when you use this cyclopropene monomer for the um, synthesis of the polymer when you treated with the grabs one um, catalyst the interestingly uh, we have found that that polymer is stereo specifically um, that is the trans that is e polymer and interesting thing is that if z is uh, you know uh, form in in this polymerization uh, process then it, it it this catalyst can sense that and it can chop the z part and forms a uh, cyclohexadiene derivative and cleave from the molecule so that is the repairing things so, uh, dna repairing type things we, we have discussed about that that uh, the catalyst is so much powerful it can sense the in this polymerization process the catalyst the z double bond z double bond is formed and then it can uh, cleave this g double bond to um, through the formation of the uh, cyclohexadiene derivative and then the polymer we obtain is stereo specifically uh, trans or e polymers so this is the beauty of this reactions dr panda yes your time is over okay okay just uh, just one minute okay okay so uh, this is this is the beauty and uh, this strategy useful for the uh, stroma fen this is a stroma fen structure uh, uh, so um, uh, this type of uh, mo the uh, mo molecules uh, we have synthesized and these are the uh, structure and and the nmr we have uh, synthesized and did some dft calculation with the help of some others uh, guys and in conclusion uh, we have synthesized some cyclopropene polymer so which can stereo specifically give the e product and uh, the molecule the catalyst is very effective for the sensing and chopping and giving this particular compound thank you thank you uh, dr panda uh, this yeah. compound is very nice okay uh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, since we are uh, running behind time uh, okay okay uh, uh, you can uh, answer one question from audience okay no problem Uh, any any question you have uh, only one question short question uh, you see cyclopropene is a strain molecule how yes. this strain can be released yeah so strain can be released by ring opening that is the best way and if you if you if you uh, see that this uh, that's why when i am using this uh, molecule uh, so every time i found some 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 uh, reactions i have uh, failed that uh, mostly the any nucleophile even sodium iodide if you use sodium iodide and if you work up with sodium chloride just brine solution then chlorine can be acts as a nucleophile and uh, the cyclopropene will be reacted that is the very very sensitive mo molecules and uh, you need to you know expertise uh, uh, to synthesize this small this type of molecule because my molecule is not only the cyclopropene it's a three member spiro with four member exactly okay 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 yeah, yeah. thank you thank, thank you. you dr panda for your yeah, nice yeah. presentation you. and now next speaker uh, dr arobindo mondol 
assistant professor department of chemistry vidhanagar college kolkata and he will talk on in bridge fuse heterocycles synthesis and application towards interesting photophysical and biological chemistry dr mondor okay okay uh, thank you ma'am uh, thank you sumita ma'am and, and thank you uh, organizer uh, and good afternoon uh, and i would also like to thank uh, the whole team uh, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, my uh, some work in this uh, this type of uh, platform so just minute i think uh, my screen is visible yes. right yes yes ma'am yes. okay yes yes okay so i would like to present my work uh, nitrogen that means enrich fuse heterocycle and importance of such type of uh, molecule like in containing heterocycle especially nitrogen bridge heterocycles we know an emerging area towards a noble kind of organic synthesis and all the bridge head heterocycles such as benzimidazole uh, pyro 1 2 apdm salt this type of uh, bridge ni nitrogen containing heterocycle carbene also uh, they are known to uh, anti tumor anti viral anti allergic uh, uh, allergic anti asthmatic uh, this type of uh, and also uh, this type of compound uh, possesses a various type of <coughs> fluorescence property and the other uh, many of them are very effective in uh, intercalate cleavage and uh, binding to uh, different type of bind towards the uh, dna so we uh, we focus this type of synthesis by using the beta bromoaldehyde and uh, here the total procedure is uh, given uh middle one uh beta bromo aldehyde and beta bromo aldehyde uh, with the beta bromo aldehyde uh three type uh, molecules are synthesis here and all these three are highlighted three three different color and first one is a polycyclic benzimidazole derivative that is top one and here with the beta bromo aldehyde uh, actylic acid and uh, uh, one two diamino benzene that that means uh, uh This, uh, when the, these two uh, all the compounds are uh, just mixed with toluene and reflux then uh, first one is uh, uh, obtained and second that is right hand side uh, pyridine one two diamine pyridium sol in uh, uh, methanol when reflux with uh, two uh, one amino pyridine then this type of compound is obtained and this is our ongoing work uh, uh, with one amino pyridine uh, this work is going on and uh, we see all these three compounds are uh, highly fluorescent active and different uh, uh, photophysical properties uh, uh, we study like quantum in but details uh, is not uh, given here so this is uh, all about thank you ma'am thank you uh, uh, dr mondor uh, yes ma'am uh, finishing your talk within time now uh, you can uh, answer i think one or two questions from the audience sure sure sure, sure. Uh, if you have any query please ask him audience all detail study uh, we have actually uh, due to short time uh, uh, not elaborately yes. given uh, yes thank you thank you so where did you do this experiment uh, in uh, your Vidhanagar College or in our college, in, in our college, ma'am, in our college, ma'am. But ah, very interesting, very interesting. Actually, we nice pull out different college like Mula Nazar College. That okay. means uh, 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 photophysical for photo photophysical study or IR spectra like this. Okay, very well, very good, very good. Okay. So uh, let me thank Dr. Mondal for his okay, uh, very good effort to do these experiments in his own college. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Mondol. Now I like to um, invite Dr. Shushant Kumar Malna, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, Vidhanagar College, Kolkata, uh, to deliver his talk on iron sensing water soluble fluorescent organic molecule. Dr. Malna, please. Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. Am I audible now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you, madam, uh, for. giving us such opportunity to deliver a lecture on the my topic i am sharing my screen which is it visible yes 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 thank you thank you uh, good afternoon to everybody and now i am presenting the topic iron sensing water soluble fluorescent organic molecule and department of chemistry vidhanagar college uh, 
one of my colleague just finishing the lecture and after that i am starting he is just sitting my beside okay whatever uh, we have we we our focus is to uh, think the such type of molecule that is containing the benzimidazolium for benzimidazole we have seen here that mebindazole mebindazole is a uh, used as a tablet uh, mainly infected by one mebase tablet people usually uh, taken at night hmm. omeprazole tablet omeg we have taken also the used tablet omeg here we seen the benzimidazole is the core in blue line and the other substituent is present in addition to this we have shown here the nitidine and akd inhibitor these two molecules also containing the benzimidazole and last one akd inhibitor core is the benzimidazole core containing l alkylated one then again this is also the nitidine l alkylated one both are very very important first one is the neutral and the second one is shown here is the charged then barbarin this is also used as a tablet people used for anti diabetic alpidem and xylotic so our focus is to prepare such kind of heterocycle which is biologically active and natural product all the molecules are conjugated all the molecules here we have shown the conjugate so our focus or we wish to prepare such type of conjugated molecule in addition they will show the corrosion property and in addition they will show the very excellent biological property therefore we have prepared here we have shown that uh, barbarin in addition to our prepare molecule this and nitidine in addition to our prepare molecule this so here few example have given we have also prepared this molecule this molecule is all the ionic charged ionic molecule in uh, we have published the paper 2015 and the next molecule a neutral molecule benzimidazole we have also published this paper. so this after preparing this molecule now we used to prepare the n alkylated salt of this molecule therefore by heating any of this compound that is the right hand side column any of this compound by methyl methyl iodide just simple silt tube heating it will give the n methylated iodide next just synthesis of water soluble fluorescent polycyclic benzimidazole uh, Bro beta bromobenzyl aldehyde similar procedure has been given here. Beta bromobenzyl after heat coupling reaction we will get the acrylic ester and that one to diamino benzene will give the this compound and methyl methyl iodide 100 degree Celsius. So first one the if we go through the mechanism it will show that condensation will take space between the carbonyl compound and the diamino compound. Dihydrobenzimidazole form and then ethyl oxidation after that cyclization and isomerization. Will gives the polycyclic benzimidazole and treating the polycyclic benzimidazole by methyl iodide, it will give the N methylated salt. We have prepared such type of example that N methylated salt uh, by varying the tetralon moiety and just methoxy by varying the one to diamino benzene by dimethyl dichloro and varying the acrylic ester moiety by methyl acrylate or ethyl acrylate. We have prepared such molecule and. then we are interested in the photophysical study uh, photophysical study we have shown here in presence of monovalent uh, say bivalent cation or monovalent cation or trivalent cation it will does not show such type of absorbance phenomena but when we change the iron if it three plus it will increases the absorbance and the similar spectra emission in emission spectra it will shows the decrease in fluorescence intensity in presence of other metal so absorbance and fluorescence gives a difference so fluorescence quenching will be shown by iron fe3 plus therefore we study acetonitrile in water medium by fe3 plus titration of fe3 plus we have shown and gradually fluorescence quenching has been observed this may be due to the the possible uh, uh, non covalent binding interaction between metal ions and the molecule maybe and similarly the edta when we titrated with this solution by edta then reversible nature is found and the fluorescence gradually increases so this is the interesting phenomena after that we are interested in their biology so same molecule have been treated for in raw cell 
a mammalian cell, it has shown that the well, increasing the time, two hour to four hour to six hour, then it has been shown that the molecule is spread over the cytoplasm and not enter in the nucleus, but it con intensity changes in the cytoplasm. That is, molecule is penetrated in cytoplasm. And in cytotoxic efficacy, it has shown that uh, 40, up to 40 and 60 microgram per milliliter, it has been shown a good effect. That is, no cell kills. Uh, it is cell viability is very good. And after the 80 and 100, when increasing high concentration, then somewhat 20% cell kills. That's why we can call that the molecule is important for biological study. After that, we have also done antimicrobial study and antibiofilm study. Biofilms means, uh, say, in our teeth, the plaque it has been happened, in, as shown that in plaque has been happened. Uh, when this is formed through the biofilm, by treating the molecule, this is, as we see in the control, after two hours, after six hours, or eight hours, this uh, bioorganism will be spread out. That is, by uh, our uh, our important molecule will show effect antibiofilm. Whatever, thank you very much every uh, to the organizer and the Sumita ma'am uh, and acknowledgement to Ghatal, Rubindra, Sotavar, Suki, Mahavita. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Dr. Manna, uh, for your nice presentation and within time. Now, uh, I like to ask you one thing. We do yes, start yes, with uh, drug DNA interactions. That means it's the interactions of these molecules with DNA because you see it mole this molecule uh, <coughs> complex with EDDA. Okay. And it is uh -huh. in So if you just do such work, uh, that will give... Uh, other informations and you can also yes yes yes, yes yes madam very good question very good question drug DNA interaction mm -hmm. uh, uh, drug DNA interaction we have shown here mm -hmm. oh, oh period of period in my own, one of my molecule one mm -hmm. of the molecule has shown very good DNA intercalation property mm -hmm. oh period of period in my own, one ionic molecule oh, uh, in our 2015 published it is shown uh, the drug DNA interaction and photo, uh, the binding constant is also into, into the 20 to our 5 word. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. Very yeah. good. Now, I'd like to ask audience if you have any question, please ask. You can ask him one short question because he has one minute time. Oh. One question What is the biological yes, activity of benzothiazole? Benzo, uh, benzothiazole? Yes. No, we have we have uh, studied with bench imidazole, bench imidazole type of molecule. No, benzo thiazole is also a biological activity. Yes. And yes, yes, yes. So, what is this use of this biological activity of benzo thiazole? Benzo thiazole. Uh, benzo thiazole uh, also an important biological active molecule, but we have not um, done this type of molecular. Uh, seen the properties in biology. Ah. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marna. Okay. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, I like to ask, uh, request Dr. Mohammad Redwanur Mandal, Assistant Professor, Department of Mathematics, Shiliguri College, and to give his talk on contribution of women in mathematics. Very good topic. Mm. Hello, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are audible. Okay. Okay. So, at the beginning, I would like to thank the organizer uh, to give me the opportunity to deliver deliver my talk. Actually, my talk is on contribution of women in mathematics. So, uh, you know, women discovered many, many things and have remarkable contrib contributions in every aspect of life. Most of them do not have formal training as well as formal education, though uh, as they are exceptionally genius and they achieved, they contributed 
over say uh, natural sciences as well as, well as mathematics and uh, in other fields also so i am going to talk something about the mathematicians of different ages women mathematicians they showed their brilliance in their respective fields overcoming overcoming every kind of negativity uh, social oppression social prejudices and so on and to talk about the great personalities great figures uh, actually one should have some uh, knowledge or sufficient knowledge on their respective fields but actually i don't have uh, such kind of knowledge i am just a learner and i am just talk about some uh, few uh, figures uh, on this fields so first of all i will uh, talk about hypatia she was uh, from alexandria of ancient egypt and then egypt uh, ancient egypt in the uh, <coughs> uh, third fourth century uh, there was a uh, illuminous uh, uh, figures of uh, say uh figures in the field of uh, science philosophy doctor. astronomy in, hello hello dr mundol we cannot see your slides i we can see only that this pc data the uh, contribution of women in mathematics you have highlighted that one but uh, uh, we cannot see the proper slides slides of your presentations is it not visible no okay okay you have to go okay. again yeah. open open it Sorry, just a minute. Okay. okay. Is it visible now? No, no, we cannot see your slides. And now now it is coming yes 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 mm -hmm. yes now we can see but again okay okay i'm mm -hmm. again sharing i think visible now it is uh, yes yes please go ahead okay okay uh, you can start uh, from okay. there uh, so hypatia yes contribution of women in mathematics etc et so this is the first slide uh -huh. uh, next slide yeah yeah this from the first uh, slide go to next slide okay next uh, next, i will talk next, about hypatia hypatia of alexandria uh -huh. alexandria slide ma'am any problem No, no. Uh, your slide is. Uh, is it visible now? No, uh, slide is not moving. Man, you cannot go from one to two or three. You have to click two or three, second or third. Okay, I will go. I will go. This one is uh, about Hypatia, three sixty to four four fifteen. Is it visible now? No, no, no. You have to go to the slides directly. So what is the? Point? Something. Man, slide is not moving. Man, from one to two, two to three. Uh, Dr. Mundal, you can just start the slide show. Just start the click on the slide show. Okay. Yes. 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 This is right. Yes. Uh, this is right. Okay. Three sixty to four hundred fifteen. Okay. Okay. Uh, it is visible. Ah uh, yes, it yes. is visible. Okay. 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 So. 
this is about hypatia his uh, father is famous mathematician and philosopher uh, theon uh, and theon actually closely supervised her to uh, brought up her uh, daughter as a perfect human being and uh, he teaches uh, hypatia uh, mathematics astronomy philosophy and she was a great teacher also and uh, she uh, as a brilliant uh, speaker uh, uh, from uh, various parts of alexandria and outside alexandria students and scholars came uh, to her and her home became a uh, say uh, say a great learning place and uh, after after that hypatia actually uh, say uh, wrote a commentary on arithmetica of diophantus in 13 books you know diophant uh, diophantine is a uh, then mathematician uh, he was great in uh, number theory and uh, just in, inspired on uh, diophantine she uh, contributed uh, and uh, she gave some alternative solutions and different equations uh, on uh, say diophantine uh, equation and she wrote the 13 books which was very famous and she, she also uh, authored uh, a treatise on the conics of apollonius in 18 books it is over uh, say geometry and uh, it tells about or uh, developed the ideas of ellipse parabola and hyperbolas and the conic sections actually and she def, uh, designed many instruments uh, uh, as for example say plain astrolabe uh, astrolab, which is very useful uh, for ship navigation to measure the position of stars planets as well as sun and she also credited for devices like uh, hydrometer so this is very few uh, from her uh, achievement or contribution next we will talk about uh, mary agnesi so agnesi actually was um, born and brought up from a rich family in italy uh, she was mathematician philosopher and theologian and as well as humanitarian she authored a comprehensive book on differential and integral calculus in uh, actually this is uh, i just told about agnesia and this is after uh, nearly 1500 years later uh, agnesi is there so uh, ne uh, during those 1500 years hypatia was considered as the only female scientist uh, scientist in the his history and uh, for uh, agnesi actually she was written uh, she written she authored the book differential and integral calculus it was uh, highly uh, uh, say a, gr a, a great book uh, it was say uh, level, uh, a, a kind of book which was praised by many scientists many male uh, mathematicians like lagrange and so on and uh, she also introduced the curve famous curve which of agnesi which of agnesi is a curve uh, we have uh, given here the uh, figure and equation and uh, she was offered professorship and uh, she was the first person first female uh, figure was offered professorship at bologna university italy next let us consider uh, sophie zarman sophie zarman was a french mathematician physicist and philosopher sophie sophie zarman uh, in her name uh, actually uh, there is a prime that sophie prime it is called sophie prime she was also contributed on elasticity number theory and differential geometry on number theory so, uh, sophie prime is the uh, great thing actually s equal to 2 if s is a prime s will be a prime prime if 2s plus 1 is prime then s will be prime and then uh, 2s plus 1 that prime will be called set prime and this uh, this is very useful to investigate Fermat's, uh, Fermat's last theorem. And this also very useful, the prime S is also very useful in cryptography. She also developed uh, mathematical models on vibration of elastic surfaces. Next, let us consider Ada Lovelace. Uh, she actually was a daughter of Lord Byron. And she lost her father in early 
is this uh, just at eight year of age she lost her father but her mother was a great uh, great woman she uh, actually uh, trained her or she uh, uh, liked uh, her daughter to teach to uh, study mathematics and science and ada loveless got many uh, figure many uh, literary figure as well as many scientist uh, and she got uh, contact with them and she was considered as the first uh, programmer and you know uh, charles babbage uh, uh, invented the analytic engine which could uh, calculate uh, which could uh, calculate many things and uh, during the contact of uh, with uh, charles babbage she also got interest and she uh, actually uh, realized that the analytic engine uh, 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 at some time will become more and more powerful and it uh, will uh, perform a huge kind of job and at a doctor mondul doctor mondul uh, your time is over but you have to focus uh, the uh, history of this ladies okay focus okay, please okay ma'am uh, okay Huh. So, at actually uh, on her honor, uh, U.S. Uh, Department of Science, uh, Department of Defense, in 1980, introduced uh, or created a programming language that is very interesting. So, there are uh, many more figures. I just uh, taken only 12 of them. Uh, may I continue? Hi, you can continue, but just tell one line about uh, these ladies. Okay. Okay, okay ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So Sofia uh, Sofia Kovalevska a Russian figure she actually was very talented and uh, she got uh, her early education but uh, she was interested very keen to uh, achieve a higher education but her country uh, don't permit her uh, she decided to travel to germany but uh, it is also uh, not uh, permitted to uh, travel beyond beyond border without uh, having uh, male partner so Uh, he was compelled to marry but that was only in paper so he got uh, one person as her husband in paper and she uh, went to germany and she uh, con- uh, come to contact with uh, karl oesters and she got a formal phd degree in uh, 1874 after all he when uh, when she uh, went back to her country russia she uh, she was not offered any job or anything so uh, then she uh, got opportunity or uh, stockholm university offered her a professorship in 88 and after that she uh, actually got some respect from her native country and she was first women member of editorial board of science journal as well as a member first member of petersburg st petersburg academy of science she was actually uh, recognized or her contribution is on koshi kovalevsky theorem is a very high level theorem in partial differential equation uh, as well as kovalevsky top parallel to the lagrange top and euler top next uh, let us come to uh, amy noether she was a french mathematician her father max noether also a um, professor in mathematics and noether is considered as the inventor of the field of abstract algebra and she established a link between symmetries and uh, conserved Uh, quantities one of the most important mathematical results in the development of physical laws she postulated principles unifying algebra geometry logic and topology she also was uh, is considered as the uh, lady einstein uh, parimala ramana uh, she is from our country uh, uh, she has outstanding contribution on uh, to algebra number theory algebraic geometry and topology and remarkable contribution on non trivial quadratic spaces over a over an affine plane she is a, a world uh, world famous figure t a saraswati amma she actually a great, great scholar in both sanskrit as well as mathematics and she had a contribution or she did a commendable job of retrieving geometric contribution of ancient india she authored the book geometry in ancient and medieval india Uh, Maria Mirzakhani um, uh, 
so the, she is a Iranian mathematician and she is so genius that she uh, got three uh, international mathematical olympiad uh, gold medal uh, one in hong kong and other two uh, in uh, toronto she is known for her original work on geometry and dynamical systems and she had uh, she has actually outstanding contribution on riemann surfaces and their moduli spaces she is the recipient of 2014 field medal which is con considered as the um, say nobel prize in mathematics she was the uh, she is the first woman to win this uh, top prize in mathematics mary lucy cartwright she is a british mathematician pioneering contribution she has pioneering contribution uh, on cartwright theorem and chaos theory uh, she became president of london mathematical society and she is the first woman uh, mathematician to ha to be elected as a fellow of royal society she had a remarkable contribution towards women higher education in uk you know shakuntala devi is well known to all of us she is considered as human computer as she had the ability to uh, calculate say uh, higher, num uh, higher digits uh, problems uh, she had the ability to multiply 13 digit number uh, random numbers if you give uh, her uh, two random numbers 13 digit numbers she can actually multiply them and she had a record she did it within 28 seconds and she had a world record a long time and after that uh, a student from st stephen's college delhi uh, broke this record next let us come to nina gupta uh, she is from kolkata born and brought up in kolkata and she is famous for her work in ellip on elliptic functions and she provided counter example of a jariski cancellation problem professor uh, she is a uh, professor at indian statistical institute kolkata and she won the highest prize in uh, science in india the shanti sharup bhatnagar prize uh, in science and technology in 2019 she also is a recipient of 2021 ramanujan prize and you see you can see i think Uh, she told that uh, earlier during uh, my post graduation i was the only only girl in my class but now when i am a professor i see more women pursuing the maths field actually this uh, now and our days these days today uh, the, uh, we have actually overcome those barriers those prejudices, prejudices uh, as well as those oppressions and now women are Uh, easily accessible we, we can easily access every field so thank you all thank you for the opportunity okay thank you dr mondol uh, for your presentations now uh, let me invite dr tapos kumar jana assistant professor department of mathematics ghatal rovindra satvarshiki mahavidyalaya he will talk on famous female mathematicians you should know Yes, thank you. Your time will start now. Am I visible? Slide is visible, ma'am. No, 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 no. We cannot see your slides. डिपार्टमेंट अफ केमिस्ट्री अफ आवर कलेज अर्गानाइजिंग the webinar international webinar contribution of women scientists in academic research uh, but uh, as a student of mathematics i think uh, i should talk uh, not on mathematical calculation uh, i just inspire our student by telling some famous famous female mathematicians about their works and uh, life already uh, my previous speaker told uh, 
some of female famous famous female mathematicians i also uh, luckily uh, i also told those female about those female uh, he also told that <coughs> okay uh, when we taught our student uh, generally when we ask them have you uh, heard oiler about oiler uh, they almost they told yes uh, we uh, uh, we heard about him he is the king of uh, mathematics again when we told when we ask uh, have you uh, heard about pythagoras archimedes or uh, taylor lagrange Uh, they also uh, told that, that they had but uh, they uh, and when we ask them told some female mathematician they told uh, they actually there are there is a stereotype <coughs> no sound from them uh, that's why i uh, choose this type of topic uh, to inspire our student uh, especially girl student uh, to <coughs> to um, take their subject as mathematics by hearing uh, the works of uh, these famous female mathematicians <coughs> unfortunately there is a stereotype out there that mathematical is a boy subject and this is uh, reinforced by the fact that most of the famous mathematician we often hear about are men however there have been plenty of women who have made ground breaking contributions to the world of mathematics <coughs> we hope that by discussing our students uh, with our students the achievements of these amazing women uh, that we not only inspire uh, young girls to pursue an interest in science technology engineering and mathematics but also young girls to <coughs> but also Uh, so all students that mathematics is a subject that can be enjoyed by everyone irrespective of gender so with that in mind in celebration of uh, women's day we have put together uh, a famous fabulous list of world greatest female mathematician that you should know <coughs> some of the uh, world's greatest famous female mathematicians uh, that i have listed here i first hear florence nightingale ada lovelace emmy noyler maria mirjakhani katherine johnson uh, first i uh, just share with you with the works and life of hypasia hypasia was the first woman to make substantial contribution to the development of mathematics she was Uh, killed by fanatical christians actually she was born uh, she was born uh, sometime between 350 and 370 in alexandria egypt uh, his father was also a great mathematician and mainly uh, on that time he is a philosopher theon uh, i was here uh, her contribution in in this field is that uh, on that time Uh, she invented the astrolabe for sheet navigation and also the devices for measuring the density of fluids uh, unfortunately her most of work has been lost but with some references uh, we got in we got something in history uh, most most crucial part of our life that as he is and as she is very much scientific uh, she is very much scientific and on that time uh, on that time uh, the male sector uh, can't accept her and brutally murdered her uh, brutally murdered her about and after the murder was so cruel 
about thousand years there was no development in Europe. This is actually uh, noted in history. So next, I told about Florence Nightingale. <coughs> she is actually a nurse. She born on 1820 at Florence, now at Italy. Uh, she is actually a nurse in a uh, military hospital, uh, but she loved uh, mathematics very much, especially statistics. Uh, after coming back from war, she worked as a statistician and used her collected data to calculate the mortality rate in the hospital. Uh, what she uh, did actually, she showed that the poor nurse, uh, poor uh, nursing, poor sanitization uh, increased the mortality rate. Uh, that's why she collected uh, the data uh, from hospital and uh, used them, used them and showed that uh, increasing the sanitary uh, sanitary system mortality rate can be increased. Uh, more. Uh, mortality rate can be uh, decreased. Uh, actually, uh, see, on 1855, uh, she uh, showed that from 60%, she showed that using good sanitary system, using the statistical data, using uh, she showed good, with good sanitary system, mortality rate can be decreased from 60 to 42.7%. She also invented uh, the polar area diagram, which is recently known as the pi diagram, uh, which is a pictorial representation of statistical data. Uh, she also recipient of some uh, very, she is also recipient of uh, very, uh, some, she uh, is also recipient of some uh, medals uh, or some honor. In 1874, she became an honorary member of the American Statistical Association, first woman to receive the old order of merit from Edward Seven. Uh, she also died on um, 1910. Next, I told about Ada Lovelace. Uh, she is known as the first programmer, is irrespective of gender. She is known as the world first uh, programmer. She was born on 1815, uh, wrote world's first computer program to help Babbage Analytic Engine. We know that Charles Babbage invented computer, uh, but when Babbage, uh, when Babbage uh, came to a came to talk in a seminar, uh, she she note uh, his lecture and. Uh, in year 18, in year uh, 1843 was possibly, uh, she wrote a program which generates Barnoni number actually. Uh, so she is recognized as the first computer programmer, irrespective of gender. Next, I told about Amy Noether. Uh, Amy Noether is a uh, very efficient mathematician. Uh, Albert, uh, even Albert Einstein referred uh, her the most creative and significant mathematicians of all time. Uh, she gave us a theorem which is known as Noether's theorem, which is published in 1919 uh, and which is considered as the as important as Einstein's theory of relativity. <coughs> Dr. Jarnan, your time is over, so please uh, make it short, okay? Oh. Next, Mariam Medjakhani, <coughs> she, is, she is the first woman to own the field medal. Uh, actually, field medal <coughs> started in 1936 and every four years, after every in interval of four years, uh, the, the field medal is given or remarkable mathematical work. Uh, Mariam Mejjathan is the first woman to uh, own that on that prize in 2014. 
Next, Catherine Johnson. Uh, she is an African American mathematician who made contribution to NASA's space program. Uh, she was featured in 2017 film Freedom Freedoms. Uh, actually, here I just uh, collected some data from uh, website of some books uh, and I conclude uh, the title actually I told the famous female mathematician you should know. We believe that uh, these women deserve to be as well known as their male con con contemporaries. With that in mind, we really hope uh, we share their uh, stories and their incredible work with your students and appreciate that mathematics is all about the journey of discovery, not someone's gender. Additionally, we must, I must mention that there are many more women out of there who have made significant contributions <coughs> to the field and we encourage you to reach them too. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jana, for your nice presentation. Now, uh, let me uh, um, invite, let me request Dr. Shantarupa Thakurta, Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, Prabhu Jagadbundu College, to give present her talk on extension of nuclear yes, equal to complexes by modifying the coordination properties of a trident with base ligand. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, is my uh, screen visible? Uh, not, not. Can you see your slides? Okay. Blank, blank. Okay. Uh, can you see now? No. I, uh, now it is coming. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay. Right. Right. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, so uh, as ma'am said, my topic of uh, today's talk is extension of nuclearity in the identity chip is ligand. Uh, the synthesis and structural studies of nickel compounds have gained considerable attention since the discovery of nickel in the active sites of several nickel containing enzymes. An additional interest uh, in nickel complexes is based on their magnetic properties with uh, potential applications in material science. Rational designing of suitable ligand system is very important for the synthesis of multinuclear nickel complexes. In this regard, monocondensed uh, tritented NNO or NOO donor ship based ligands, which are the condensation product of amine and aldehyde, find a significant place in coordination chemistry. Many square planar mononuclear nickel complexes have been successfully synthesized so far from uh, various tridented ligands, where uh, the fourth coordination site of the square plane is occupied by a terminal co-ligand like chlorido or thiocyanito or azido. One of the most used strategies to design and construct uh, new nickel to magnetic materials is to use uh, neutral mononuclear complexes known as metalloligands. These complexes can further coordinate other metal ions through two external oxygen atoms, uh, then forming phenoxo bridged binuclear or trinuclear complexes. So, in this present work, I have synthesized a NNO donor sheet based ligand, which is a condensation product of one is to one condensation product of two piculyl amine and orthovanillin. This is a potentially tetradentate chelating ligand with donor atoms, imine nitrogen, pyridine nitrogen, phenolic oxygen, and methoxy oxygen. And this ligand can also exhibit bridging properties through phenolic oxygen atoms. Now, I have carried out separate reactions of this ligand with nickel salts uh, using various metal to ligand mole ratios 
also in presence of thiocyanate as a co-ligand. With modulation of reaction conditions, the bridging property of the ligand can be utilized. And this leads to the extension of nuclearity of the complexes from mononuclear to trinuclear. So as we can see from this scheme, uh, when the metal ion concentration is uh, taken in excess, then we get the trinuclear complex. Both the complexes are characterized by IR and UV visible spectroscopic studies and their structures are established by single crystal X-ray diffraction studies. Here is the crystal structure of the first complex. Uh, this is the auto view of complex one. Uh, we, can now, uh, um, we can now discuss the structural features of complex one. Uh, uh, the crystal structure of complex one, uh, as we can see, has two independent molecules, A and B, in the asymmetric units. And these two units have almost similar geometrical features. During complexation, the enol form of the ligand uh, coordinates the central uh, nickel using the NNO donor set. And a terminal thiocyanato ligand completes the coordination around the nickel center, giving rise to a square planar geometry. Uh, the trans angles deviate from the ideal angle of 180 degree. Also, the dihedral angle between nitrogenimine nickel n pyridine and oxygen nickel n thiocyanato planes is about 3.6 degree for unit A and 4.9 degree for unit B as compared with zero degree for a perfect square planar geometry. So this indicates a minor twist in the square towards tetrahedral arrangement. And uh, uh, we can see the unit cell packing diagram of complex one uh, here. So uh, the two crystallographically independent molecules form a dimeric unit through the CHO intermolecular hydrogen bonding via the uncoordinated methoxy cytoms of the ligand. And also uh, the, from the unit cell packing diagram, it is clear that uh, in the solid state, pi pi stacking interactions involving the pyridine and phenolic rings of the neighboring molecules give rise to a one dimensional supramolecular structure. So let us now focus to the structural features of complex two, which is a trimeric complex. Here, the trimer is formed by three octahedral nickel-2 atoms, of which the central nickel-1 is located on a crystallographic two-fold axis. So, the two terminal nickel centers are strictly equivalent. Here, the terminal nickel atoms are connected to the central nickel atom through two different kinds of bridges. There is one mu 2 phenoxido bridge uh, from the sheep base ligand, and a mu 2 sincine bridging acetate anion. The phenoxido uh, NiO Ni nickel oxygen nickel bridging angle is about 117 degrees. Uh, the central nickel one is coordinated, it is octahedral, and so it is coordinated by two cis phenoxido bridging oxygen atoms, two cis acetate bridging oxygen atoms, and two cis oxygen atoms from two methoxy sidons of the two sheep based ligands. And each equivalent external nickel to atom is coordinated by NNO donor sheep base and oxygen from the bridging acetate ligand, uh, N bonded uh, thiocyanate terminal ligand, and the methanol mo molecule. So overall, we get the complete octahedron. And uh, also, uh, if we notice uh, here, the trinuclear core adopts a less common angular conformation rather than the common linear arrangement. So the nickel-nickel angle is about 150 degree. And here, the trinuclear core is stabilized uh, somewhat uh, through a pair of intramolecular hydrogen bonding which is formed between the hydrogen atom of the coordinated methanol molecule and the oxygen atom of the bridging acetate to ligand. So uh, let us now discuss the magnetic properties of the complexes. As a result of the structural variations, these two complexes exhibit very different magnetic behavior. 
the magnetic uh, moment value of complex one is nearly zero, which means it is uh, diamagnetic and it is expected because uh, square plane and nickel complexes, they adopt a D8 configuration and all the electrons are paired. So overall it exhibits diamagnetism. But complex two, it has three unpaired electrons. It is octahedral, all the nickel uh, atoms are octahedral. So it has overall all three unpaired electrons which are linked by bridging oxygen atoms. So here is a chance that magnetic coupling will take place. So we have uh, studied the magnetic properties of complex two in details and here uh, are the results. The thermal variation of molar magnetic susceptibility per nickel trimer times the temperature, that is the variation of KMT with temperature indicates that complex two presents a weak antiferromagnetic coupling. We have fit the magnetic properties of complex two with symmetric linear S equal to one trimer model with the only one exchange coupling, J, between the central and external nickel ions. The J value is minus uh, 3.22 centimeter inverse. And we have also investigated the magnetostructural correlation and established a, a linear relation between J and the dihedral angle theta formed by the planes containing the nickel oxygen nickel and the carboxylate bridges. And the correlation uh, is in the following form, like J is equal to minus 7.13 plus uh, 0.25 into theta. Uh, we have carried out detailed magnetostructural correlations, uh, which is not, uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, discuss in details. So okay. we can conclude that um, the modulation of coordinating properties of the sheet based ligand can control the nuclearities of the resulting complexes with extension of nuclearity of nickel to complexes from mononuclear to trinuclear. There is a scope of development of useful magnetic materials. Thank you everybody for listening. And I will especially like to thank the organizers of this conference for giving me the opportunity to present my talk. Thank you all. Thank you, Shantarupa. Uh, very nice presentations, very good work. And uh, if any, you can answer one or two questions from the audience. Yes, yes. yes. So audience, if you have any question, please ask her. She's, uh, she has finished within time. Uh, one question. Can yes, nickel limine complex show photophysical mm -hmm. property? Uh, photophysical, actually, I have worked with zinc complexes, uh, this type of ligand system and zinc complexes, and they exhibit excellent photophysical properties. But for nickel, uh, actually, I haven't gone for this uh, fluorescence or luminescence studies, so I have not explored that area. Actually, I have not tried with nickel complexes. Actually, nickel complexes uh, are not a very good fluorophore. Okay? Exactly, exactly. You have to do absorption studies. Ha, ha, right? Exactly. exactly. And so, now, uh, uh, now one question. Now one question. Yes. If this complex is made by ruthenium or uranium, then yes. this nickel complex can show the photophysical property. Uh, you, you want to say if we may make some mixed uh, metal complexes or we can try this sheep based ligand with ruthenium or uh, actually uranium. So mm. Actually, I have not tried that field, so I'm not very many sure about the results. I'm mainly working with transition metal ions like copper, nickel, manganese. And as I have said, I have um, got uh, successful uh, photophysical properties only with zinc and cadmium to some extent. But I haven't explored that ruthenium or uranium like things. Yeah. So I'm not able to un answer this one. Okay. 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 Thank you, Shantarupa. Thank you, Shamita. Uh, 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 now, next speaker is Dr. Pritha Mondol. Assistant Professor, Department of Chemistry, Krishnanagar Government College, Krishnanagar. Uh, she will talk on structure perturbation of gallicin one in presence of uh, fluoroalcohols. Okay, Pitha, Dr. Pitha. Yes, yes, yes.
Yes. Yes, speak up. Start. Good afternoon. Am I audible? Yes. Uh, yes. Yes, Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, you are audible. Uh, Myself, Dr. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Myself, Dr. Kritha Mondol, Department of Chemistry, Krishnamur Government College. The topic of my lecture is Structural Perturbation of Galactin 1 in Presence of Fluoro Alcohol. First, I should uh, introduce Galactin 1. Galactin 1 is a beta galactoside specific, very important animal lectin. It has various biological functions. It has important roles in cell addition, growth regulation, and cancer metastasis. Uh, it exists as a non-covalently linked homodimer of 14 periodontal subunit having two carbohydrate recognition domain per dimer. Crystal structure of galactic mount displays typical jelly roll topology similar to that of ligand lectin, although there is no detectable sequence similarity. Each subunit consists of five and six stranded antiparallel beta sheet. Both beta sheets extend across the dimer interface to create the continuous 10 to 12 stranded antiparallel beta sheet. The fluoroalcohol induced structure perturbation studies are very important in protein folding research. 222 trifluoroethanol and 1133 hexafluoroisopropanol are widely used to denature and characterize non native secondary structures in protein folding studies. These fluoroalcohols cause disruption of native structure and tend to stabilize alpha helical structure of proteins and peptides. Individual proteins have specific helix forming propensity depending on amino acid sequence. In this work, non native states of galactin 1 dimer and also the monomer was induced by TFE and HFIP. Galactin 1 monomer was generated by denaturation in presence of 0.5 molar bond in hydrochloride, and for structural studies, CD and FTI spectroscopy was used. Uh, in this slide, the figure shows the far elicited spectra of galactin 1 dimer in presence of increasing concentration of TFE at 20 degrees centigrade. In absence of TFE, the protein exhibits a typical beta sheet band shape with characteristic negative peak at 270 nanometers. With addition of TFE up to 10%, this band shape remains unaltered. Then the spectrum begins to change significantly, and in presence of 30% TFE, it assumes alpha helical band, band shape characterized by two negative peaks at 219 and 207 nanometers. With further increase in TFE concentration up to 80%, the alpha helical band shape passes with progressive rise in the intensity, which indicates more and more helical transformation. Another cofolvent HFIP was also used for the structural perturbation study of galactin 1 dimer. This figure shows the far reducing spectra of galactin 1 with increasing HFIP concentration. In contrast to TFE, limited addition of 10% TFE, 10% HFIP induces change in the spectral band shape. The spectra broadens with increasing, uh, with increasing negative intensity. The CD spectra uh, acquires a prominent alpha helical band shape at HFIP concentration of 30% onward. The secondary structure components were estimated by deconstruction of the pharmaceutical spectra using CDNL software. So here the figure shows a plot of change of secondary structure elements, uh, beta sheet and alpha helix, as a function of TFE or HFIP concentration. With progressive addition of TFE, helical component quantitatively increases at the expense of the sheet structure and finally reaches to 30% alpha helix at 80% TFE. In the left hand side, the figure is for HFIP. For HFIP, sorry, in the right hand side, the figure is for HFIP. For HFIP, quantitative helix induction occurs in lower concentration at 40% HFIP, that is much lower than TFE. Uh, this implies that HFIP exerts more perturbation influence than TFE for helical conversion. However, more addition of HFIP does not lead to further helix transformation. The reversibility of fluoroalcohol induced transition of native beta sheet to non native alpha helix conformation was examined. After generation of maximum amount of helical form, the fluoroalcohol was removed by extensive dialysis and the resulting protein sample was characterized by CD. Here the figure shows the far spectra of galactin 1 before TFE addition 
and after cliffy removal it is seen that with removal of cliffy alpha helical band disappears and in and uh, instead native like typical beta sheet band shape reappears and uh, this result shows that reversible nature of conformational transition of galactin 1 under the influence of fuel alcohol uh, galactin 1 as i said previously galactin 1 monomer was generated in uh, exclusively in 0.5 molar bond to hydroxide and under this condition far uv phase spectra could not be recorded below 205 nanometer this figure shows uh, the figure at right left hand side that uh, the far uv phase spectra of galactin 1 monomer in presence of various concentration of tfe without tfe the series spectra exhibits typical beta sheet band shape with negative peak at 270 nanometer as for the dimer in presence of lower concentration of tfe that is 10 to 20% the band shape changes and the minima shifts at 226 nanometer like an atypical beta sheet with significant loss of intensity the decrease intensity probably arises due to the formation of aggregation under this condition on further addition of tfe visible aggregation disappears and the far uv series spectra tend to assume alpha helical band shape with progressive increase of signal uh, of the uh, negative signal up to 50% percent tfe analysis of the series spectra data up to 205 nanometer shows that 17% alpha helix is induced solely from beta sheet components the uv series spectra of galactin 1 monomer in presence of hfip is very similar to that stability of the secondary structure of galactin 1 was monitored in the temperature range from 5 degree centigrade to 60 degree centigrade by far uv city in absence of fuel alcohol the native beta sheet conformation of the dimer was found to be invariant with temperature that this indicates that the native beta sheet conformation of the dimer is thermally stable up to 60 degree centigrade but for the, uh, the uv city spectra of the monomer at different temperatures shows that the at 60 degree centigrade the typical beta sheet band shape of the monomer is deformed indicating low stability of the sheet conformation of the monomer than that of the dimer uh, the beta sheet to alpha helix transformation was monitored uh, at different temperature uh, range within 20 degree centigrade the figure represents the uv series spectra of galactin one in presence of 50% tfe at different temperature Uh, as it is shown, the spectra includes alpha helical band and alpha helical with this range. However, uh, the intensity of the alpha helical signal decreases with rise in temperature. This result implies that induced helix has reduced thermal stability. The reversibility of this heat-induced alpha helix thermal conversion has also been examined. It is observed that the decreased intensity of induced alpha helix at high temperature. is completely regained upon lowering the temperature uh atr spectroscopy is, uh, is widely used uh, often used uh, to uh, investigate the secondary structure components of proteins uh, via the investigation of the um, mainly the amide one band this figure shows the atr spectra of native dimer in, in absence and in presence of different tfe one concentration native galactin one exhibit the amide one band at 30 cm this is like 30 cm inverse and which is characteristic of beta sheet structure uh, in presence of 80% tfod a new amide one band is obtained at 651 cm inverse indicating at least partial transformation to alpha helical conformation analysis of the spectra reveals 35% helix in the helix induction which results solely from the change of beta sheet as the yield of alpha helix is almost same as the decrease in beta sheet content the atr uh, spectra for the monomer uh, exhibited similar results and this result uh, is uh, you know in good agreement with the uv uh, uv cd far uv cd experiment uh, in at a glance we can say that the cosol ray induces partial at least 35% helical structure in the beta sheet protein galactin 1 only sheet components seem to be transformed into helix other secondary structure components are not involved intermediate tfe concentration induces aggregation of both galactin 1 dimer and monomer sheet helix transition is reversible increase of temperature destabilizes the non negative states and as a concluding remark i can say 
that galactin 1 sequence has partial helix propensity and a non-negative state may be involved in the folding pathway of the protein. I want to acknowledge my PhD supervisor, Dr. Deepak Kumar Mondal, for guidance in this work. And lastly, I want to thank you all for listening to me. Thank you, Prita. Nice presentations. And you have also finished within time. Now, if you have any, the audience, if you have any question, please ask. Only one question to her, very short question. Okay, I think there is no question, Pita. No, one, one question, one question. Okay, okay, okay please. Can, can protein molecules show photophysical property? Mm. Yes, protein molecules are uh, Protein molecules like the tryptophan, PIRN, this type of amino acids, so, so they are. Uh, Good food, of course. They show photophysical property. The, spe the spectroscopy is used for their uh, structure analysis. Exactly. Mm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Prita. Thank you, Prita. Okay. Mm. Now, uh, let me invite Dr. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, let me invite Mr. Deepak Vadodia. Uh, he is from Medicinal and Process Chemistry Division, CSIR Central Drug Research Institute, Lucknow, and CSIR Kaziabad. Okay. And he will talk on yes. visible light promoted three component cycloaddition reaction synthesis of four functionalized one five dye substituted one two three triazoles. Okay. Uh, Mr. Yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Hello. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. you yes, I'm going to share my screen. Mm. Okay, is it visible to everyone? Uh, yes, 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 yes. My yes. slides are showing? Yes. yes. Okay, okay. Thank you for my introduction, ma'am. Mm -hmm. And good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you for giving me this opportunity to give, present my work here. Myself, Deepak Badoria, working as a senior research fellow under the supervision of Dr. Atul Kumar, chief scientist from the Medicinal and Process Chemistry Division of CSIR, CDRI, Lucknow. My title for presentation is Visible Light Promoted Three Component Cycle Addition Reaction for the Synthesis of Four Functionalized One Five Dye Substituted One Two Three Triazoles. Next introduction. Sulfonyl isophores are members of one of the most important class of bioactive molecules. Among them, sulfonyl and one two three triazoles isophores have a broad range of activities such as anti HIV, anti tumor, anti inflammatory, anti cancer, anti diabetic, etc. Especially 145 tri substituted 123 triazoles is considerably important and heterocyclic exports, and they have innumerable applications in modern organic chemistry, drug discovery, material science, pharmaceutical industry, and medicinal chemistry. The previous conventional method for the cycloaddition reaction of alkynes with azides used copper catalysts and ruthenium, nickel, radium, etc., as a novel catalyst for the radioselective formation of 15 di substituted and 14 tri substituted 123 triazoles. Next, okay. These are the some examples of biologically active molecules. Here, these are the some sulfonyl containing group molecules like glucosamide act as a anti-diabetic agent. Atoric coxib act as a COX2 inhibitor. Sildenafil, sulfonyl antibacterials. And in the second part, these molecules containing both sulfonyl group. For example, first one is a bromodomain inhibitor. Second is an anti-inflammatory agent. Next, we have benzene sulfonamide, which act as an anti cancer agent, and so on. So, on the basis of these bioactive molecules, we have designed our compounds, which is contain both sulfonyl group and triazole scaffolds. So, these are some previously reported synthetic approaches for 145 tri substituted 123 triazoles. First of all, Song and co worker developed the radiodivergent rhodium 1 catalyzed formation of both regiomers 4 sulfonyl and 5 sulfonyl 1 2 3 triazoles using internal thioalkynes and azides. And this reaction is controlled by the non metallic sulfur second and sulfur 4 in A1. 
In very recently, in scheme A two, Coe's group also disclosed ADM one catalyzed directly group promoted radioselective synthesis of one for di substituted five functionalization one two three trizol jide and internal alkynes. On the other hand, compared to metal catalyzed three component approaches. Uh, Joe Group had developed the copper catalyzed synthesis of five substituted trizols from alkynes, azide, and different heteroatom electrophiles in scheme B1 and scheme B2, like teen copper transmetallations. However, all of the above approaches suffered from the need of pre-functionalization of substrates, have narrow surface scope, expensive starting materials, toxic transition metal catalysts, and under desired byproducts. Therefore, from a environmental and economical point of view we wish to report a first visible light promoted and photocatalyst free three component approach toward the four functionalized one five dye substituted one two three trizoles with readily available starting materials in an aqueous medium at room temperature that is skin c to the best of our knowledge a visible light promoted and photocatalyst free three component direct annulation reaction of terminal alkynes Sulfenic acid, sodium salt, or sulfonyl hydrazides in an aqueous medium at room temperature is unexplored to a date. So, this present developed protocol has many attractive features such as being non toxic, cost effective, and readily available starting materials, ligand and transition metal free, etc. So, next we move to optimization of the reaction condition. We commence our studies by investigating the visible light permuted three component model reaction of the phenyl acetylene 3 4 dimethylphenyl. Azide and palatolium sulfonic acid sodium salt or sulfonyl hydrazide, and the desired product was observed different reaction condition. And the results are shown in the table. In the entry number one, in our standard condition, this is our standard condition when we use aryl alkyne sulfonate salt and azide and react in the presence of the iodine and potassium carbonate using ethanol water as a solvent system under irradiation of the 20 watt white LED at room temperature, and it gives our the desired product in 84% yield and 80% yield. Then we for the optimization of the bases in entry from 2 to 6, 7, and different solvent systems were tried. And the yield is somewhat low as compared to our best condition, that is entry number one. We have also performed the our reaction on different light source like green LED, blue LED, red LED, but the yield is somewhat lower than the standard conditions. So under the best optimization condition in hand, we synthesize our substrate scope using various aryl alkynes, aryl azide, and sulfonic acid sodium salt derivatives. And the reaction goes, reaction goes well with the, all the substrate scope. Next, we also try with different sulfonyl hydrazide instead of sulfonate salt. And the reaction is tolerable with the, this uh, sulfonyl hydrazide source. And for synthetic utility, a scale up experiment is carried out, and reaction is also feasible when the gram scale synthesis of is carried out in desired product in 81% yield. In order to explore the reaction mechanism, we have conducted various controlled experiments, as shown in this first part one, where we when we tried reaction without uh, iodine and without visible light, without uh, our waste. K2CO3, the reaction does not go well and the product is not formed. And to confirm the whether our reaction is goes through radical or simple ionization, the reaction is carried out with the presence of a radical scavenger like tempo, and the desired product is formed in traces. That means reaction doesn't go well and it confirms the reaction follows the radical pathway. To confirm the presence of a utility of our light source, in an on and off, on and off experiment is carried out, and it we have shown that when the light is source is on, the reaction is carried out. When we off the light source, reaction does go on, and it comes that the reaction is goes in only in the presence of light. And to the next. So on the basis of these controlled experiments, a plausible mechanism has been derived and initially sulfonyl radical intermediate one is produced by the sulfonate salt reacts when they react with the iodine radical followed by the single electron oxidation uh, process in the process in the presence of the white light. And this sulfonyl radical intermediate one coupled with the aryl alkyne to generate vinyl sulfon radical intermediate two 
which react with iodine radical to afford iodobenyl sulfone intermediate 3 this intermediate 3 benyl iodobenyl sulfone react with the aryl azide and undergo nucleophilic addition reaction which further undergoes to form 3 plus 2 3 plus 2 cyclo addition reaction to afford the intermediate 5 which finally provide the desired product 1 to 3 triazole in by the elimination of the hi in the presence of the base and we get the our desired triazole product here 5a2 and the structure of the our product was confirmed by the electrocrystallography here we shown the structural of our moiety and to finally i would like to conclude in summary, we have developed the first visible light promoted and photocatalyst free three component strategy for the radio selective synthesis of the four functionalized 1 5 di substituted 1 2 3 triazoles by a cyclo addition of the aryl azide in situ generated the iodobenyl sulfone that is a substituted alkene in an aqueous medium at room temperature. This novel methodology cultivates the various four sulfonoid 1 5 di substituted 1 2 3 triazoles under mild condition with the advantage of cost effectiveness, a broad substrate scope and functional group compatibility. Gram scale synthesis good to excellent yield with high radio selectivity. More of this present protocol is transition metal free, cheap, readily available starting materials under environmentally benign conditions. Compared to the classical copper azide alkyne and ruthenium and nickel azide alkyl, radium azide alkyl cyclic addition click chemistry that construct 1,4 or 1,5 disubstituted 1,2,3 triazoles and 1,4,5 trisubstituted 1,2,3 triazoles. Next, I would like to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Tul Kumar, that is a chief scientist and head of the division, MPC division, from the CSIR Central Drug Research Institute, and our division, MPC Medicine and Process Chemistry Division, ACSIR and CSIR for the fellowship and grants, and Department of Chemistry, Gatal Rabindra Sattavarsky Mahalile, for giving me this opportunity to present here, and all my seniors, colleagues, friends, and well-wishers. Thank you, and happy Women's Day. Okay, thank you, Mr. Yes, Badaria, for nice presentations, yes, and we have finished in time. Now, if any question from the audience, please ask him one short question. One, short question. one, question, one question: Is yeah. there any photo effect of the triazole derivative? Photo effect of the triazole derivative? Yes. Yes, on prolonged heat uh, carried of carrying of reaction, like our reaction is. Uh, occur in, in two to four hours. When we carried out the reaction longer time, longer irradiation time, like 12 hours, 16 hours, the triazole moiety is broke down and the NTO is released and something is from other, not desired product. Okay, thank you, so Mr. Badudia. Yeah. Mr. Badudia, thank you yes, for your answer. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to uh, invite you of assistant professor and head of the department, Department of Chemistry, and she will talk on and study on degradation of organic inorganic polymer nanocomposites. Dr. V, please. Hello. Uh, thank yes. you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, ma'am. Just a minute. Okay, ma'am. Uh, is my slide visible? No, no, no. Slide has come. Please show the slide first. Okay. Is it visible now, Mama? No, 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 no slide. You cannot okay. see this slide. I we have, have to share it again. I think. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, yes. Nice. Okay. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, myself, Dr. Shalwali Hui, Assistant Professor and Head of Department of Chemistry, Hijri College, Kharagpur. Today, I shall discuss about uh, an in-depth study on degradation of hybrid organic inorganic polymer nanocomposites. Uh, my presentation includes the following points. Before going into the detailed discussion, I would like to give you some preliminary idea about polymer. So what is polymer blending? It is an economical and promising route to develop new polymeric materials. Thermoplastic elastomers are special types of polymers, polymer blends or composites, which combine the functional properties of conventional cross-linked thermoset elastomers and the favorable processing characteristics of plastics. One common way to produce these TPEs is blending, but the TPEs have certain disadvantages. They have very poor set, poor oil, chemical, and heat resistance. One common way to overcome these difficulties is dynamic vulcanization process, where the elastomeric phase as well as its interface along with plastic matrix are cross-linked moderately. This improves multitude of properties, although the processability is sacrificed to a certain extent. Dynamic vulcanization imparts compounding complexity and trims down the purity of the TP systems, which restrict their use in food packaging, pharmaceutical, and biomedical applications. So, the another alternative may be selective confinement of reinforcing fillers. In this context, I have chosen low density polyethylene and ethylene vinyl acetate copolymer for my present work. I have not selected any established TP system because both LDP and EVA have good thermoplastic elastomeric properties and they have a difference in polarity. So, when we use nano silica particles, then uh, the polar nanosilica particles will be selectively located into the polar EVA phase. Here, my first objective is to study the thermal and thermooxidative degradation characteristics of nano silica field LDP EVA based model TP system by thermal analysis. And my final objective is to correlate these thermal properties with nano and micro scale morphology. I have already told that I have used LDP EVA containing 40% phenyl acetate, silicon dioxide nanopowder, and silane coupling agent. And I have used these techniques. The samples are prepared in melt mixing condition in Bravender plastic order by varying to different sequences of addition. In sequence one, first LDP is mixed with EVA, then to it, silica particles are added. So it is expected that the silica particles should be present in both phases as well as in the interface. And in sequence two, first EVA and silica are mixed to produce a master batch. Then it is blended with LDP. So uh, here it is expected that most of the silica particles should be present in the uh, EVA phase. Let's see what happens in reality. This is the sample designation table where C stands for control blend, A stands for silica. This number indicates the loading percentage of silica. So this one is 1.58% silica in sequence 2. This one 3 weight percent silica sequence 1. 3 weight percent silica in sequence 2. Last one is 5 weight percent silica in sequence 2. And this one is the sealant loaded sample. Let's come to the results and discussion part. These two are TGA thermograms of nano silica field samples. Here you see that uh, a two-stage decomposition is observed, uh, but uh, no drastic improvement in thermal stability is observed upon addition of silica, whereas a modest improvement is observed only in case of 3 weight percent silica loaded sample in sequence 2. And this one is the TGA thermogram in oxygen atmosphere. If you compare pure EVA with field EVA, then you see the percentage of weight loss is much less in silica field EVA in the first step. This is because silica particles influence the initial stability of EVA wherein oxygen diffusion is restricted. 
and these are the TGA thermograms of field samples in oxygen atmosphere. A dramatic change in thermal stability is observed in oxygen as compared to nitrogen. Here, all the samples uh, show two-stage decomposition. The first step corresponds to deacetylation of vinyl acetate group of EVA with elimination of acetic acid and formation of double bonds. And the second step involves further degradation of polyacetylene ethylene chains that form in the first step along with uh, degradation of the LDP. And here the initial stages of the de decomposition for all the samples are accelerated where the initial part of degradation is controlled by oxygen diffusion. Interestingly, the thermograms of all the field samples are shifted towards higher temperature as compared to the control blend. This indicates the improvement in thermal stability upon addition of silica. But silica accelerates the degradation of uh, field samples at higher temperature. This is because of the fact that above 430 degrees centigrade, silica itself acts as an acid catalyst. And the parameters obtained from TGA thermogram are summarized here. Here you see the maximum shift of onset of degradation is observed only in case of silane loaded sample. This indicates that silane increases the compatibility between the two phases and makes silica well dispersed in both phases as well as in the interface. And in case of sequence 1, the thermal stability is higher as compared to sequence 2 up to 20% conversion level. This reflects the possibility of intermixing in sequence 1 due to its preparation procedure which leads to the strengthened silica polymer interface. As a result, the degradation is prohibited and oxygen diffusion is restricted. But at higher temperature range, sequence 2 shows higher thermal stability than sequence 1. This is an indication that uh, either the partial polarity of vinyl acetate moieties in EVA or the intrinsic fluidity of the elastomer at higher temperature enhances polymer silica interaction. As a result, the thermal degradation is retarded due to the barrier effect of silica particles. Let's come to the kinetic analysis and here I have used Flynn Wall Uzoa and Kissinger Akahira Suno's method. And I have calculated the mean activation energy by both non-isothermal and isothermal methods. And both these methods uh, show similar trends. In all cases, the activation energy is higher in case of silica field samples as compared to the control blend, which further reflects the enhancement in thermal stability upon addition of silica. And sequence 1 shows higher activation energy than sequence 2, which further confirms the initial higher thermal stability of sequence 1 than sequence 2. Let's come to the morphology. Uh, in order to investigate the state of dispersion of silica in this bicomponent polymeric matrix, stem analysis has been performed. Here, all the samples are stained with osmium tetroxide, which combines with EVA. So here, the EVA phase appears as dark and LDP phase appears as bright. Besides this, a light gray phase is also appear which most likely represents the interface and intermixed portion of rubber plastic phase. Uh, comparing sequence 1 and sequence 2, the probability of silica particles to be present in both phases as well as in the interface is more in sequence 1 than sequence 2. This further reflects the possibility of intermixing of both phases in sequence 1 which is also evident from our thermal results. So we can say that the thermal results are well correlated with the morphology. Similarly, in sequence 2, most of the silica particles are concentrated in the EVA phase. Quite a few are visible in the interface and in the amorphous portion of semi-crystalline LDP. Interestingly, the silane-treated silica particles are dispersed more uniformly as compared to the untreated silica revealing that surface modification of silica increases its affinity towards a more hydrophobic polymer matrix. And this is the FHM photomicrograph of 1.58% silica loaded sample, where the average diameter of silica particles varies from 12 to 200 nanometer, which indicates a fine dispersion of silica. 
So overall, you can say from the morphology results that it is well correlated with the thermal properties. So finally, we can conclude from these results that in nitrogen atmosphere, no significant changes were observed in terms of thermal stability of such systems, whereas in oxygen atmosphere, a dramatic change in thermal stability was observed. The initial part of degradation was probably controlled by oxygen diffusion, decomposition of LDP, and acetic acid elimination from EVA. And the next stage of degradation was found to be a strong function of mutual interactions between EVA and nano silica. Silane coupling agent provided a significant thermal stabilization. Most importantly, the thermal stability of such TP systems was a strong function of morphology, which in turn was decided by the sequence of addition of ingredients during blend preparation, amount of nano silica addition, and the presence of coupling agent. Finally, the mutual interaction of the polymer matrices with nano silica fillers strongly influenced the kinetic parameters. And these are some of my references. So thank you very much. And I would like to thank the organizer for giving me this opportunity to present my work. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. V, for a nice presentation. And we have also finished within time. If uh, any question from the audience, please ask her only one short question. Okay. Achha, one question, please. Yes, uh, in, instead of silica, if we use zinc oxide or carbon oxide, there will be any problem? Uh, then, sir, atomic, as the atomic number is very high for zinc and uh, um, cadmium, then uh, the, I, I think uh, that this, there will be dispersion problem in the polymer matrix. Another question. Instead yes. of viva, if we use MMA, yeah. then there will be problem? No, no, no. Both MMA and NIFA, uh, both are polar and uh, the property will be better in case of MMA. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Hui, for your nice presentation. Thank you. So, uh, let me invite Dr. Pradyot Nanda, Assistant Professor, Department of Physics, Dinobundu and Rus College, Kolkata. He will talk on conductivity enhancement in polymer electrolytes or different compositions on gamma irradiation. Dr. Nanda. Dr. Nanda. Thank you, madam. Okay, okay, okay. okay. Thank you. Please, go ahead. Ma'am, are you visible? Uh, let, let it come. Okay. okay. You have to electrolytes. This is visible, huh? This one is visible. But uh, yes, 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 yes. Now start. Now please start. You talk. Good afternoon, respected ma'am and mm -hmm. my dear colleagues. I am Pradyut Nando, Assistant Professor of Physics, Dinamundu Andrews College. Let me start my presentation topic, Conductivity Enhancement in Polymer Electrolytes of Different Composition on Gamma Irradiation. Come to the point of my topic, start with solid polymer electrolytes have potential application in various high energy electrochemical devices like rechargeable battery, fuel cell, display devices, etc. Next, one of my most study system is polyethylene oxide, which serves as a model polymer for a variety of application. Then, polyethylene oxide has an exceptional property of dissolving high concentration of wide varieties of salts to form polymeric electrolytes. There is a search for process which may reduce crystallinity and enhance conduction. 
for example irradiation irradiation can be bring changes in polymer by ion beams electron and photon that can be cause advantages or harmful therefore polymer electrolytes are material with a potential for extensive use in practical device next i have to go identify radiation resistance materials as well as radiation sensitive materials is necessary as its result indicate that there is a variation in various physical and electrical properties of a polymer salt complex by exposure to high energy radiation like iron beam electron beam x ray and gamma ray when we see there is a such changes in microstructure and molecular weight of a system through cross linking and scission of the long polymer chains both process may occur simultaneously but usually on dimension there are a good irradiation effect is manifested by changes in crystallinity melting temperature mechanical properties and effect segmental motion of the polymer chains there are crucial in the determining electrical properties like ion conductivity of the polymer salt complexes we see in this study polyethylene oxide complex with x fraction by weight of ammonium perchlorate 18% 16% 20% 24 and 26% salt concentration is irradiated with gamma dots varying with 10 kg to 50 kg at temperature 25 degree centigrade to 65 degree centigrade my previous work resulted the irradiated sample that 16% salt concentration produced the maximum ion conductivity the changes we have produced on irradiation are study through the differential scanning calorimetry x ray diffraction fourier transfer rate infrared infrared spectroscopy and viscosity measurement this and infrared spectroscopy measurements and compare with that the for unaided samples we observation the of dsc result show a symmetric variation with irradiation dose of an interesting observation is the presence of two minima for certain doses here we take a position of the minima shift with radiation dose indicating a change in melting temperature the results are shown in this figure the unaided dsc curve show the two minima the difference is at 71.53 degree centigrade and there is a less prominent minima 60.53 degree centigrade it is observed the presence of the two minima indicates presence of the two different crystalline species with different melting point when dose increases the differ through the becomes less prominent until at 17 kg the two minima at 69.22 degree centigrade and 57.4 degree centigrade are almost equal in the on further increase in dose 50 kg the higher temperature through almost vanishes now the only prominent minima is at 57.93 degree centigrade so finally only one of the crystalline species survives the radiation the other probability becomes amorphous the area from baseline within the dsc curve has been calculated for all doses a plot of the total area within the dish in the observed heat versus temperature curve against the variation dose is shown in this figure 
when dose increases, the area decreases monotonically, indicating a decrease in crystalline. In this figure, decrease in area of the DSC curve with temperature has an exponential feed to the curve, assuming that the area is proportional to the crystallinity. This variation can be understood that that produced the proportional change in crystallinity. There is a systematic variation with irradiation dose in DSC car made for the sample with 24 and 26% soil concentration, the area from the baseline within the DSC curve has been calculated for the all doses. The DSC curve and plot of the total area versus radiation dose for samples with 24 and 26% soil concentration are shown in this figure. It is seen that the both samples as dose increases, the area decreases steadily, indicating a decrease in crystallinity of the sample. The impedance spectroscopy result gives us for the different concentration of gamma dose have been analyzed for the samples. In going study of the complete cold cold plot reveals the features which give the important information about the sample. The cold cold plots at a specific radiation dose but at different temperature for samples with different concentration are shown in this figure. The real part of admittance versus frequency plot for different concentration in this figure. The DSC conductivity can be obtained from a cold cold plot by locating the point on the real Z axis. A plot of the DC conductivity of versus gamma radiation dose for the different samples at 35 degree centigrade is shown in this figure. The samples with the both 16% salt concentration and 20% salt concentration show in increase in conductivity at 30 kg irradiation and subsequent drop at 40 kg. However, samples with 24% salt concentration show a maximum conductivity at around 20 kg dose with a fall at higher doses while sample with 26% soil concentration show a steady rise in conductivity with increase in radiation dose. We can find out that the ion conductivity is highly sensitive to both soil concentration and radiation dose. Up to a particular value of concentration, conductivity increases due to the increase in change carrier, sorry, charge carrier in, in this study is the large enhancement in iron conductivity obtained for 16% salt concentration at 30 kg. This enhancement by two order of magnitude is much larger than for other concentration. It will be useful to study different concentration and irradiation dose at closure interval in order to identify the reason well, where the enhancement is most pronounced. The conductivity was found to the very low and irradiation did not produce the significant improvement. On this study, my explanation for the initial increase and subsequent decrease in the conductivity on irradiation is an interesting question the effect of gamma radiation on polymer is primarily cross-linking and season of the macromolecular changes. However, these two processes take place simultaneously, although usually one dimensional over the other depending and several factors. In general, season increases flexibility and segmental motion of the chains loading to an increase in conductivity. So, season may also increase crystallinity since smaller changes align and from the order 
any more easy. Thank you all. Thank I have completed my topic. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nanda, for your uh, presentation. And now, since we are uh, running behind time, uh, I will not request audience to ask you any question. Uh, so I will. Uh, I shall. Uh, Ma'am, one question. Ma'am, one question. One question. One question. question. Very short. Huh? Very short. Yes. Uh, now, if polyethylene oxide is mixed with a surfactant like uh, cetyl pyridium chloride, will conductivity increase? Yes, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, actually, uh, however, the, in the cold pole floor, the low frequency reason the attributed the, uh, to an impedance of the electrodes to uh, semicircle representing the sample in the presence. The, this is the semicircle arrives due to the uh, prevalence of two different conductivity phases due to the, the existence of the phase boundary between the amorphous crystalline stages and the, in the different samples. Okay. 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 Thank you, Dr. Nanda. Now let me invite Dr. Papia Dutto. Thank, assistant, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, assistant Professor, Applied Science Department, RCC Institute of Information Technology, Belaghata, Kolkata. Study of metal complexes containing umaril, azoemine, and diamine ligands. Okay. Dr. Dutto, please. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for the introduction. I hope my screen is visible also. No, no, no. No, no. We cannot see your slides. Okay, just a minute. Mm. Is it visible now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Very good. Uh, please go ahead. Mm. Mm. Yes. <clears throat> good afternoon, all the respected delegates, research scholars, and students present here. Today, in the Women's International Day, first, I would like to thank the organizer for selecting the topic of this conference. Now, many of my previous speakers have already talked about the contribution of women in the field of industry and academia. I would like to add just one more thing that if we go through the statistics regarding the number of female Nobel laureates till date, then the figure will be like this. 16 uh, women have won, won the Nobel Prize in literature, 12 in, physio uh, in physiology or medicine, seven in chemistry, four in physics, and two in economic sciences. So with this brief introduction, I would like to start my presentation on the topic study of metal complexes containing kumaril, azoemine, and diamond ligands. So the main features of my topic uh, are Importance of kumarin system, then preparation of the ligands and metal complexes, extracrystallographic studies, spectroscopic characterization, photophysical study, theoretical calculation, and applications of the metal complexes. So kumarin is a very natural, naturally occurring compound, and this is very important. The uh, the kumarin derivatives, these are studied very extensively because of many reasons. They have rich variety of uh, biophysical properties. Their photochemistry and photophysics are also very important. And the kumarin derivatives are also very much uh, biologically active. They are proven to be very good anticoagulants. Anti antibacterial agents, anti-tumor, and even in written, recent studies, it has been established that they can uh, they even can prevent cancers also. So, in our study, we have uh, designed these uh, these ligands, these azoemine ligands. So, these are the optimized structures of the ligand. 
So here in the uh, ligand system, you can find this is the coumarin part and it is coupled with the imidazole system. And different substituted varieties of imida imidazole uh, is, uh, are taken. For example, here for methylamine, here for phenylamine, and so on. So this is the synthetic procedure part for the preparation of the ligand and the complex. First, we have taken the normal coumarin. Then we have nitrated it with mixed acid to prepare the nitrocoumarin, 6-nitrocoumarin. And then it is reduced with iron powder to produce 6-aminocoumarin. So with this 6-aminocoumarin, we have coupled it, coupled it with imidazole, sub, imidazole and substituted imidazole to prepare this azoamine uh, coumarin, this combo ligand. Now, this ligand is then treated with uh, the, uh, the ruthenium and osmium metal precursors to prepare the metal complexes. Now, in the synthesis part of the complexes, first the metal complex, here we have taken osmium hydride as the metal precursor, and it is then, uh, it is then reacted with the ligand in, uh, under nitrogen atmosphere at room temperature to prepare the neutral compound. And uh, in the, under the refluxing condition, we, we got this uh, ionic compound. And it is precipitated as perchlorate. Perchlorate. This is the extra structure of the osmium hydride compound complex with the uh, coumarin azomidazol ligand. So here you can see this is the Azo, uh, this is the azo nitrogen atom and this is the nitrogen atom of the imidazole. So it is directly bonded with the osmium metal. And in the electronic spectra, here uh, I want to mention one thing that all the coumarin azo imidazole ligand as well as the ruthenium and osmium complexes, these are fluorescent. Though the fluorescence quantum yield is not so high, but still it varies in this range. And the lifetime of the compounds, they vary almost to the 2, 2 to 10 nanosecond region. And we have carried out the DFT calculation using Gaussian 03 software. And what we, got, uh, what we get from the uh, DFT calculation is that the HOMO is mainly constituted by the metal ion, but, but as well as uh, some, uh, that, is, that means the ligand is contributed to a very uh, major amount. So here you can see in the picture that the ligand is considered almost 70%. And in LUMO also, the uh, LUMO is mainly constituted by lig ligand is almost 90% it is constituted. And in the uh, ionic compound, here we can see that in HOMO, there is a contribution of metal, the ligand, as well as the triphenyl phosphine ligand. And in the, the, the LUMO is mainly constituted with the ligand, coumarin azomidazole ligand. Now, these results are useful by uh, uh, regarding uh, explanation of the electronic transitions, as well as the redox properties of the complexes. Now, uh, another very unique property shown by this uh, ligand, as well as the complexes, is the photovoltaic effect. We have carried out the photovoltaic experiment with both with the ligand, as well as with the uh, metal complexes. And here, the metal complexes or the ligands, they act as the dye. So, it is the these are used in dye-sensitized solar cell. So here the dye is actually the optically active material and it is actually uh, dispersed in polyvinyl alcohol as well as in, uh, in polyethylene oxide and uh, which is complex with lithium perchlorate. And this mixture is sandwiched in be between the two electrodes. So this is the uh, 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 experimental setup. So what we ultimately get is that, so these are the IV characteristic curves of the complexes. And this is the curves which shows the photocurrent growth in the complexes. So initially you can see here that the photocurrent growth 
and after some time the there is uh, decay is observed similarly for the second complexes also same feature and while calculating the efficiency that is the photocurrent efficiency though the photocurrent efficiency is not so great but the trend that we observe that in case of metal complexes the photocurrent efficiency is little bit higher compared to the ligands so from this we can have the idea that we if we can modify the ligand then the photocurrent efficiency might increase now why these disensitized solar cells are very important because you know the solar battery you can find the application of this solar battery in scientific calculator in pv crystal in uh, the uh, crystalline pv cell and in many other uh, cases also and in recent times the disensitized solar cell is a very promising field because nowadays the efficiency of the disensitized solar cell they are even reaching closer to the original solar cell so the uh, in future the this highly expensive solar cell it is possible that the highly expensive solar cell might be replaced with this type of disensitized solar cell so now we are going to the diamine system so the diamines uh, the diamine ligand it is synthesized from the 6 amino coumarin by coupling with uh, this uh, this ligand and ultimately we are getting this compound this is the coumarin coumarin sheet base and this coumarin sheet base is then reacted with the hexacarbonyl metal precursor of chromium molybdenum and tungsten to form this tetracarbonyl complex इंटरक्शन बिटवीन कार्बन हाइड्रोजेन एंड ऑक्सीजन now all the complexes are characterized uh, characterized by ir nmr spectra in ir spectra the uh, the characteristic lactone spay peak is obtained almost around 1581 cm inverse and there is also some peak uh, related to the c double bond n also actually the lactone frequency comes around 1714 cm inverse and c double bond n frequency it is coming around 1581 cm inverse region and all the carbonyl uh, carbonyl they also the presence of the carbonyl also proved from the ir frequency that they almost come in the region 181020 uh, 2020 cm inverse region now the uh, doctor doctor uh, uh, your time is over so please make it short okay make okay. it uh, so one of the, uh, the characteristic feature of this type of compound is that uh, this uh, this tetracarbonyl uh, diamine system they exhibit solvatochromism that is with increase in solvent polarity the absorption maxima shifted towards the lower wavelength region so in this case we are uh, seeing the blue shift as you can you can see from the figure and now i want to mention just one thing that why this compound are uh, important in general the carbonyl compounds are considered to be very toxic even the tetracarbonyl compound also but this is the first time uh, report from us that we establish that this type of tetracarbonyl coumarin sheet base compound they act as potential antioxidant compound and here from the figure itself you can see that the all the metal carbonyl compound they can uh, they exhibit efficiency almost in the range 90% and among them the uh, tungsten carbonyl compound shows the maximum efficiency so with this i would like to conclude that here we are uh, synthesize all, all these complexes and the 
uh, these, these complexes are char uh, characterized with the help of the spectroscopic technique and their structure is confirmed from the single crystal X-ray diffraction study. The ligands as well as the complexes, they are highly fluorescent and the coumarin, com coumarin complexes are found to be, uh, and they, they show uh, effective antioxidant behavior and the group 8 metal carbonyl complexes shows photovoltaic effect. So with this, I would like to end my lecture here. Thank you all for your patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dattu, for, uh, in, uh, for an interesting talk. Uh, if you have any question from the... Uh, uh, one uh, question, ma'am. One question, ma'am. Very, very short question. Uh, yes. Because, uh, we are yes. running behind if we, if we made Kumarin imin ligand and make it complex with copper, Will it show photocurrent? Uh, that we have not examined, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you, Dr. Dattu. Uh, and uh, now, Dr. Shubhupriya. Shubhupriya, Shubhupriya or Priyo? Shubhupriya, ma'am. Shubhupriya Chatterjee, Assistant Professor, Department of English, Gauravgui Memorial College. We'll talk on strength, flexibility, and mobility. A reading of Sisters in Science by Dean Jordan. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Good Dr. afternoon. Dr. Chatterjee. Yeah. Yes, this is uh, Dr. Shubhapriya Chatterjee over here. And uh, today my topic of discussion is strength, flexibility, mobility, uh, a reading of Dean Jordan's Sisters in Science. Please allow me to share my screen with you. Is it visible? Yes, 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 it is visible. Okay. So, Diane Jordan, as we know that, uh, uh, we all know that she is a professor uh, of biology at Alabama State University. And this book written by her, that is Sisters in Science, Conversations with Black Women Scientists on Race, Gender, and Their Passion for Science, was published by Purdue University Press on 11th August 2006. And it is the first book of interviews with prominent black women scientists across the United States. These black women scientists are pioneers in their chosen scientific profession and represent a broad spectrum of disciplines, ages, and geographical locations. Each interview allows the reader to delve into the soul of the scientist to express her challenges and to witness her triumphs despite obstacles. Diane Jordan allowed 18 prominent black women scientists, uh, scientists to talk for themselves and thus created a significant record of women who took the pain to become first in many of their fields. It began for Jordan when she was asked to give a presentation on black women scientists. She found little information and help. Uh, after almost nine years of work, the stories of uh, black women scientists can finally be told. And uh, as we all know that women can play a pivotal role in the progress and sustainability of the world if they are empowered through education and employment, opportunities in science, technology, innovation, and through changing the social uh, stereotypes that restrain them in certain uh, workplaces. Uh, and the purpose of this study is to understand the challenges uh, and the coping strategies faced by female scientists around the world by a critical reading of Diane Jordan's Sisters in Science. So what are the key factors perpetuating the uh, gender gap that exists in the uh, study of science and technology? Uh, we know that uh, girls and women are systematically uh, tracked away from science and math, from the study of science and math throughout their education, limiting their access, uh, participation, preparation, and uh, opportunities to go into those fields as adults. And uh, in this book, we find that 
uh, Diane Jordan had studied uh, the interviews of several women scientists. Uh, for example, we have Hattie Carwell, we have Vaughn Young Clark, we have Anna J. Cobble, we have Freddie M. Dixon. All of them were interviewed and uh, their interview uh, interviews were, uh, de uh, the details of those interviews were recorded and presented to us in the form of a book. And if we closely study those interviews, we will find that the challenges that many potential young black female scientists face uh, when uh, selecting science as a career. And for those black girls, the dilemma of choosing uh, science as a career is compounded by issues of race as well as gender. So why do so few black women enter scientific careers? Uh, what can they teach us about black uh, women uh, who survive and succeed in science? Uh, uh, we can uh, conclude that, uh, that their strategy uh, that they followed was uh, self-confidence, uh, dedication, hard work, uh, these were the most commonly adopted coping strategies of these uh, successful scientists. And uh, in conclusion, we uh, also can say that female scientists face numerous challenges which can greatly affect uh, both their individual and career growth. Uh, Diane Jordan's study on the number of females in top positions in scientific research suggests that unintended and subconscious gender bias is common and can result in barriers for women to be promoted and credited for their achievements. By bringing uh, these issues and concerns out of the shadow, we hope that female scientists will be able to take active measures to push back against the trouble spots that continue uh, to, change, uh, to challenge women's equality. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Shubhapriya Chatterjee, Dr. Chatterjee, uh, for a nice uh, talk. Uh, and so uh, I like to um, close this session for oral presentations. And I like to thank all the speakers for their uh, excellent talk. And uh, now uh, let me start the poster presenters poster presentations. And the first presentation will be by Rimita Bhor, Research Scholar Department of Education, Kollani University. And she will uh, give the poster on the invention of uh, didactic apparatus and art education by Madame Montessori for self-development of children. Yeah. Uh, Ritima Bhor, please try to finish it by five minutes. Okay. Ma'am, I am audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, ma'am. Thank you for my uh, introduction. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am, and all delegates and everybody. Thank you to give me the opportunity to present my paper, and I am feeling honored to be a participant and as well as paper presenter in this inst international webinar that is Contribution of Women Scientists in Academia and Industry. Uh, I am Rimita Bhor, from, uh, a research scholar of Education Department in Kollani University. And right now I am going to be share my uh, presentation. Uh, ma'am, is it visible? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it okay, is visible. Okay, ma'am. Okay, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, this is my uh, well, short uh, introduction. I am Dimita Bhor. I'm from India, country from India. Achha, uh, my department is education. Research scholar of my uh, I'm the research scholar of education department um, in uh, Kollan University. My topic is the invention of didactic apparatus and the art education by Madam Montessori for self development of children. Uh, we all know the Montessori method actually. Uh, Madame Montessori was a renowned Italian physician and great educationist mainly known about her Montessori teaching method. She also the founder of didactic apparatus, Kasha Dai Bambini, set curriculum in the field of academic, which was well known as the field of education. 
Mantashari method is actually that type of method which is based on self-directed activity, hands-on learning, and collaborative play. In Mantashari classrooms, children make creative choices in their learning while the classroom and the highly trained teacher offer age-appropriate activities to guide the process actually. Didactic apparatus is that Madam Mantashori introduced a didactic apparatus which can control the child's error and enhance the child's capacity to rectify himself or herself. In her educational program, she laid her equal emphasis for muscular training along with the training of mind and senses. We know the uh, we have the five senses. So uh, she wanted to teach the, the children uh, from training of mind and senses. Importance of didactic apparatus is this. Uh, I just uh, read out two or three. Uh, they enrich the sensory experiences, uh, motivate the learning, uh, stimulate the imagination and the capacity of abstractions of the students. Uh, and this is all that. Then I go to the Casa de Bambini. This is a uh, uh, Latin term. It is meant the children's house. Italian Casa de Bambini preschool, it firstly, uh, she established by Mother Montessori in Italy. It was a unique method because it focused on educating each child based on his or her development stage. Madam Mantashori encouraged children to take ownership of what they wanted to learn and worked with each child to create a personalized education and played to that child's strength. Set curriculum, she also told about the set curriculum. What is the set curriculum? It is mean that uh, from the set curriculum, it allows children to learn at their own individual pace and follow their unique interest, resulting in enjoyable learning, which is reduce the problem behaviors of students in the school. Five key areas of the study. In the set curriculum, Montessori offered children five key areas of studies. These are practical life, sensorial, uh, mathematics, language, and cultural studies. Each area of study is made of a set of educational materials that increase in simple to complex. And last of all, the art education as therapy. The art education is such type of activities which is to utilize the creative process to help children explore self-expression and in doing so, find new ways to gain personal insight and develop new coping skills. Through this, Manteshwari wanted to help children explore emotions, develop self-awareness, cope with stress, boost self-esteem and work on social skills. There are various types and techniques of art education. These are all collage, coloring, doodling and scribbling, drawing, finger painting, painting, sculpting and work with play. Objectives of my study is to find out the innovative method of learning, to get a relief from the traditional teaching learning method in classroom, to enhance the motivational level of children, to increase the interest of learning in academic level to give an interesting learning environment in particularly class limb, to create an enjoyable learning and there are other objectives I just keep it and my hypothesis is three hypotheses i uh, just uh, took the three is the null hypothesis first one is there is no significant difference in interest level in traditional method and montessori method in classroom teaching Second one is there is no significant difference in achievement level in traditional method and Montessori method in classroom teaching. And the third one is there is no significant difference in performance level in traditional method and Montessori method in classroom teaching. My methodology was here I choose 50 samples by using simple random sampling and I use lottery method for choose my 50 samples between two, 200 population. To conduct this study, I chose four schools. I selected two urban schools and two rural schools. I selected urban schools and rural schools to avoid types of residents in my study. I wanted to see the rural and urban students simultaneously. And samples, actually uh, I got, uh, uh, previously I just told here, that I, I just took 50 samples around 2000 population. And I took 50 samples from there, 25 boys and 25 girls to avoid gender bias in my study. 
I also took adolescents age range between 14 and 15 years. That is class 8 and class 9 standard student in West Bengal schools. I took four schools from Hooghly district and only focus on West Bengal Bengali medium board school. Procedure, the treatment process involved the boys and girls in both individual and group. After the treatment process involved the boys and girls in both individual and group in use of Montessori method. After doing the treatment process involved the boys and girls in both individually. And after doing this information conducted in non-directive fashion with the student here through interview, the student's reaction reflected back to encourage additional thought and reflection. All the students are cooperated during the interview sessions. And I got a result after using the traditional method and Montessori method of control group and experimental group. I used the chi-square method to see the result. The hypothesis of rejected, the uh, critical value at 0 0.5 level of significance. The hypothesis are also rejected in critical value at 0 0.01 level of significance. So it is clearly depicted the Montessori method is more effective in learning outcomes of the children in school setup. Outcome of my study, in my study, I got that Montessori method like set curriculum, art education as therapy, didactic apparatus, Casa de Bambini, all are very much useful to enhance interest level, motivational level for learning new things, increase achievement level, and as well as increase the performance level of the student learner in the classroom and school setup. And last of all, my delimitation of my study is here I only taken school going children. I only choose urban and rural children. I only focused on Montessori method. In my study, I just focused on adolescent students. Here, I only taken 50 samples, only seen the achievement level, only see the performance level, only took Bengali medium school, and only took the age range in 14, 15 years of adolescent students. And at the last of no, conclusion is that in this study, the null hypothesis are rejected and it clearly seen that it is more effective of Montessori method rather than traditional method in classroom teaching, learning, and it is very effective to learning outcomes of children in their own interest, bring self-esteem and own pace of learning by learning by doing for their reality and experimental learning environment. And that is, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rimita, now yes, next, next presentation uh, is by Mr. Anand Kumar. Mr. Anand Kumar, you please try to finish it by five minutes. Anand Kumar, he is research scholar, Department of Mathematics, JP University, Bihar, Chapra, Bihar. He will uh, give poster on a special type of operator called Fort to Jackson. Okay. Anand Kumar. Anand Kumar. Achha, if uh, Anand, uh, I think Anand Kumar is not here, so I like to uh, uh, request Priyanka Meena, research scholar, Department of Chemistry, University of Delhi, and yes, her uh, our poster is on transition metal free anti marconicov hydroamidation of alkenes with aryl am aryl amides. Okay. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Priyanka. Ma huh? Am this I time, audible, ma'am? Five minutes. Yes, you are audible. Okay. Am I visible, ma'am? No. Just a minute, ma'am. Uh, am I visible, ma'am? Uh, dim dimple, Mina. Presentation. No. Dim Dimple Mina is presenting. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, Am I yes. visible now? Uh, yes, yes. You are visible. Oh, okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, please try to finish it by five uh, minutes. Good, af 
Yeah, ma'am, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. First, to thank you so much, Momenta, ma'am, to give me the opportunity for the presenting work in this webinar. And uh, here I am going to present my uh, uh, research work on the transition metal free anti marconico hydromination of alkene and arylamide. Uh, now, here we, uh, we represent uh, best base promoted reaction to give uh, aryl ethyl benzamide. And the key features of the reaction is that transition metal free reaction along with the good ratio uh, show a broad substrate. Now, the background of the work is first to consider the uh, Wanderhof group present Markovnikov addition reaction and the, in the presence of platinum. And uh, in the second, the Lambarch uh, group has shown the Markovnikov hydromination using the platinum catalyst. And uh, But in our, our case work, uh, we have shown the first anti Markonikov hydroamination using only only base in KOS DMSO. Now here we have shown scope of vinyl arene. We have using electron withdrawing groups and electron releasing group uh, substitutory styrene and also a aliphatic alkenes in uh, and uh, next is scope of arylamide. So uh, here we have used in methyl methoxy methyl methoxy and hydroxy nitro uh, nitro group hydroxy and uh, nitro group and cf3 etc substituted amide and uh, here we have shown the chemoselectivity hydroamination using two, two amino and four amino benzamide uh, in which uh, reaction takes place only on uh, on amide instead of the amino group here we have used the heterocycle moieties uh, the nicotinamide and thiamide and uh, they shown good yield of desired product Next, uh, we have shown some comparative selectivity in control experiment, and we have used two comparative study of alkyne and styrene, and uh, they got and we got uh, the uh, we got the eleven we got the eleven in seventy seven percent in when we use the fetal group, uh, and uh, we have used the to to toloethylene group, and we got the seventy two percent yield of the desired product eleven B. And in and uh, hydroamination uh, versus intramolecular cyclization, then uh, the uh, the formation of the nine ninety two percent yield of desirable thirteen. And uh, we have used the control hydroamination when we have used the one three divinyl arene in presence of DMSO and uh, the formation of one one side attack uh, of amide is 63% yield of 14 and seven uh, double side attack of amide then 67% yield of desired product 15 and we have used the different uh, 26 uh, uh, nicotinamide in presence of dmso and uh, the standard condition then formation of the first uh, first attack of its time in 66% uh, yield of desired product 16 and the 65% yield of desired product 16 dash and modification of probin uh, probinated derivative when we have used the probinic, acid, uh, probinic acetamide in presence of uh, styrene, then we got the 78 percentile of desired product 9. And control experiment, we, when, we have uh, when we have used gram scale experiment, then we got uh, 78 percentile of desired product 3A. And when we have used the tampon AIBN in one equivalent, then, the, then we got, do not uh, obtain, then we uh, don't obtain the desired product TA. In presence of chronic ether, then uh, again we do not we do not obtain the desired product. That means the uh, the role of the potassium KOH ion and uh, as well as it in the presence of tempo, uh, the pro product is not formed. That means the, the, the mechanism pathway is go through via radical and the mechanism is the uh, when we have used the benzamide in presence of the tensile radical and uh, generate the radical species C and the uh, uh, polarized alkyne uh, alkene is in presence uh, in, is react with the anti markonikov attack and formation of benzyl uh, benzyl radical uh, species C D and the uh, DMSO give the pro uh, proton then formation of desired product uh, three. And the conclusion in the this study disclosed the first example of anti markonikov addition of aryl amides and vin on vinyl arenes styrenes under the metal-free condition with excellent chemo and regioselectivity. 
Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Priyanka. Now, uh, let me call Shubha Shom, students, uh, MSc yes, third year, same Vidya Shakur University. And his poster is on contribution of women scientists in academia and industry. Shubha. Shubha or Shubha? Shubha Shom. Shubha Shom. Okay, okay. Please try to finish by five minutes. The screen is visible, ma'am. Uh, please uh, make it wider, narrow. Uh, just yes, yes. Now it is. Contribution of I am Suvosom, student of MSc third, third uh, MSc third semester, Bidas University. Contribution of women in scientists in academia industry. This is very, very prepared uh, from the previous, uh, from the oldest time. There are many women physicians and physicians are in the in the Pharaoh's court during the second density of Egypt in 2700 BCE. Mary Path was a female key physician in the Pharaoh court. From there, in the uh, next, Mary Curie was the first woman in the Nobel, get Nobel Prize. Mary Salomon Slokudaka Curie was a Polish and French scientist. He is educated in University of Paris and Flying University. He discovered, discovered two, uh, two metals, radium and polonium. He get Nobel Prize in physics in uh, 1903 uh, and uh, Nobel Prize in chemistry in 1911 uh, and also get Meticulous Medal in 1904, Albert Medal in 1910, Debbie Medal in 1903 and Antonium Prize in 1907. Next, Osma Chatterjee. Osma Chatterjee is an Indian scientist and also from Kolkata. She is an Indian organic chemist and photomedical research on Venica alkaloids, antipolytics, drug development, and of anti natural drug. He is educated in Calcutta University. Award he get. Uh, nine, he selected in 1960. He she selected a fellow on Indian National Science Academy, New Delhi. In 1960, she award Santi Sarov Bhadnagar Award in Chemical Science. She is the first female awarded with Padma in 1975. She gets C.P. Raman Award and P.C. Roy Award and S.S. Bhadnagar Award also. Charusita Chakraborty. Charusita Chakraborty was an Indian academic and scientist. She was the student and professor of Delhi University research field. She, uh, she, she, she's research field was theoretical chemistry and chemical physics, classical and quantum metacoral, molecular dynamics, and structure and dynamics of liquids. She get also she also get uh, the Santi Sarov Award in 2009 uh, for scientific and technology. Yamana Krishnan. Yamana Krishnan is an Indian organic chemistry scientist. She educated in University of Madras, Indian Institute of Science. She, uh, she's research field was organic chemistry. She also gets Santi Sarov Bhadnagar Award and Infocus Prize. Mary Gall. Mary Goffer Meyer. Mary Goffer Meyer as a German physicist and mathematician. She got awarded with Nobel Prize in Physics in 1963 for numerous contribution to the field of physics. She was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize for theoretical physics and second woman in history of Nobel Prize. Research field. She is most famous for proposing the nuclear cell model of the atomic molecule, atomic nuclei. She, not, she also noticed the repetition of seven magic numbers 28, 20, 28, 50, 82, and 126. Magic number is the element, magic number is the number which elements contain this magic number have proton and neutron are consistently more stable than other elements. Conclusion is that women are in scientific academia industry are very well and also women are in our in the our daily the in our everywhere women are very essential women are very uh, okay thank you Shubha thank you Shubha hmm. thank you ma'am अच्छा Mr Anand Kumar are you here or you have left the meeting yes madam Oh, so please start. Start your presentation. 
And Mr. Alan Kumar, Research Scholar, Department of Mathematics, JP University. Madam, hello. Yes, yes. You start. You please start. JP University, Chapra, Bihar. We can pass. Hello, madam. Yes. 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 Yes, madam. Yes, yes. Just, just speak on that arrow, arrow. Yes, madam. Share हो रहा है. नहीं हुआ. अभी नहीं हुआ. Hello. Hello. हाँ, madam. अने अ your screen is not visible. नहीं, नहीं, नहीं हुआ. हाँ, yes, yes, yes. It is now shared. Just open your PPT now. स्पेशल टाइप ऑफ ऑपरेटर कॉल्ड फोल टू जक्शन एबस्ट्रेक्ट है मैडम In this paper, we use two notation of the projection operator in linear space as the summon S F introduct to topology and modern analysis. In analysis, is the above of the notation we have introduced a new type of operator called Cole to Jackson on a linear space. It is a generalization of projection operator in the sense of the every projection is a Cole to Jackson. But pole to junction is not a necessary a projection. We shall study a pole to junction on R and consider different examples of pole to junction. Keyword has madam linear space projection trijunction tetrajunction and pole to junction. Introduction a linear transformation on L into itself. We refer to its a linear transformation on L. Also, E is called a projection on M along N, where N is a linear subspace of M. Clearly, E is square equal to E. In analogous in this def definition and trijunction operator, E has been defined by Dr. Prabhat Chandra in. His PhD thesis, PU 1977, titled "In Investigation into the Theory of Operator and Linear Space by the Relation E Q Equal to E," where E is a linear trans linear operator on a linear space L. Clearly, if E is a projection, then it is also a trijunction of E square equal to E. Therefore, E Q equal to E square into E. Therefore. E is into E. E is square equal to E. Where Rajiv Kumar, Dr. Rajiv Kumar Misra, in his PhD thesis, JPU 2010, titled "A Study of Linear Operator in Related Topic in Functional Analysis," has defined a linear operator E is E on a linear space L on the tetrajunction if E to the power four equal to E. From the concept of projection tetrajunction. Trijunction. We define in logics a new type of operator E called pole to junction. If E to power four equal to E square, it is a generalization of projection operator in sense of every projection is a pole to junction. But pole to junction is not a projection. This will be clear from the following examples of pole to junction in given below. Examples, madam, we are where consider C. Where C is a set of all complex number and Z be the elements of C square. Thus, let Z equal to x y. Where x y belong to C. Let E Z where E x y equal to A x B y plus C x into D plus D y. Where A B C D are scalar. By calculation of the find that 
ई स्क्वायर इक्वल टू ई ए वन एक्स बी वन वाई सी वन एक्स और डी वन वाई वे आर ए वन इक्वल टू एक्स ए स्क्वायर बी सी बी वन इक्वल टू ए बी प्लस बी डी सी वन इक्वल टू सी ए प्लस बी सी और डी वन इक्वल टू बी सी प्लस डी स्क्वायर ऑल्सो ऑल्सो ई का पावर फोर इक्वल टू ए टू एक्स बी टू वाई इन टू सी टू एक्स और डी टू वाई वे आर ए टू इक्वल टू ए दी पावर फोर प्लस थ्री ए स्क्वायर बी सी प्लस टू ए बी सी डी और प्लस बी स्क्वायर सी स्क्वायर प्लस बी सी डी स्क्वायर बी इक्वल टू ए एस क्यू बी प्लस ए स्क्वायर बी डी और प्लस टू ए बी स्क्वायर ए प्लस इस तरह से कैलकुलेशन है मैडम वे आर ई एज ए फोर टू जक्शन वे आर ई दी पावर फोर इक्वल टू ई स्क्वायर एक्स वाई हेंस ए वन इक्वल टू ए टू वे आर नाउ वी कंक्लूजन ऑफ द फ्लोइंग केसेस लेट ए इक्वल टू बी इक्वल टू जीरो देन फ्रॉम टू वन जीरो जीरो है तो फ्रॉम टू टू भी जीरो जीरो होगा और फ्रॉम टू थ्री भी सी और डी का क्यू इक्वल टू सी डी देर फोर सी डी इक्वल टू डी स्क्वायर माइनस वन इक्वल टू जीरो सी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू जीरो और डी इक्वल टू माइनस वन ऑल्सो फ्रॉम टू पॉइंट फोर डी की पावर फोर इक्वल टू डी स्क्वायर डी स्क्वायर इक्वल टू डी माइनस वन इक्वल टू जीरो डी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू माइनस वन सब केसेस है मैडम वेन सी इक्वल नॉट इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू जीरो देन ई एक्स वाई इक्वल टू जीरो और सी एक्स एस ई स्क्वायर सी एक्स इक्वल टू ई इन टू ई सी एक्स और ये ई स्क्वायर इक्वल टू ई एक्स वाई आएगा तो ये जो है ना मैडम दस क्लियरली दिस केसेस ई इज ए नाइदर प्रोजेक्शन नो ट्राइजेक्शन बट इट इज ए फोर ट्रोजेक्शन बिकॉज ई के पावर फोर इक्वल टू ई स्क्वायर सब केसेस सेकेंड है मैडम वेन सी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू जीरो देन द केसेस विल बी दस इट इज ऑल्सो ए also since e is a projection trijection tetrajection as well as four to junction and cases three may have c equal to 0 and d equal to 1 calculation ke baad madam e square equal e ka power 4 equal to e e e q equal to e square equal to e this means this cases is projection trijection tetrajection as well as four to junction सब केसेस फोर है मैडम सी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू वन देन वी गेट ई एक्स वाई जीरो और माइनस वाई है तो ई स्क्वायर एक्स वाई और ई एक्स वाई दिस मीन्स कैलकुलेशन वी दिस है ना दस दिस इन दिस केसेस ई नाइदर प्रोजेक्शन नो ट्राइजेक्शन बट इट इज ए टेट्राजेक्शन एज वेल एज फोर टू जक्शन सब केसेस फाइव में है व्हेन सी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू माइनस वन है दिस कैलकुलेशन दिस रिजल्ट इज दस इन दिस केसेस ई इज नाइदर प्रोजेक्शन नो ट्राइजेक्शन बट इट इज अ टेट्राजेक्शन एज वेल एज फोर टू जक्शन एंड केसेस सिक्स है व्हेन सी इक्वल टू जीरो एंड डी इक्वल टू माइनस वन दिस मीन्स देयर कैलकुलेशन वी सेल आई वी दिस Thus, in these cases, E is a projection, trijection, tetrajection, as well as four to junction. And cases second may have A equal to A A equal to C equal to zero. Then from two point two one equal to zero zero, and from two point two two equal to B D Q or B D or B equal to so therefore B equal to zero and D equal to zero and and D equal to plus minus one. From 2.3 to 00 and from 2.24 equal to d to the power 4 and d square. Therefore, d equal to 0 and d equal to minus plus 1 है. सब इसे सही कह रहे हैं हम 2.1 when d equal to 0 and d equal to my d equal to not 0 and d equal to 0 then then this in this case is e is neither projection nor trijection but it is a four to the sun. And some cases 2.2 है when b equal to zero and d equal to zero then we shall also we shall also also see in the sub cases 2.11 when 
in the cases is projection and trijection tetrajection as well as four to the sun and mr mr anand mr anand mr. please make it short yes ma'am yeah you have uh, exit exceeded the time ठीक है मैम b equal to uh, one and d equal to one therefore in this it has been already seen in this case is to one point three b as projection trijection tetrajection as well as four projection and sub cases two point four then b equal to one d or d equal to minus one in this case is e is neither projection nor trijection but it is tetrajection as well as four projection मैडम Thank you, madam. Thank you, thank you. Now uh, we have finished uh, uh, the poster session. Uh, now I like to thank all the presenters for oral and as well as poster. And I like to thank Momita for giving me this opportunity to chair the session. Thank you, Momita. Okay. Thank you, ma'am, for devoting so much time with us today. Oh, okay. And this is I so late it. in the afternoon. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, and thank you for conducting our uh, presentation session. And uh, now I would like to request uh, Mr. Deepak Kumar Mukhopadhyay to kindly uh, address the concluding remark for the session. Thank you, all the honourable speaker, for delivering such beautiful and valuable speech. You are all very talented. and your valuable speech encourage ourselves in various aspects and enlighten the success of this webinar thanks to all of you thank you thank you uh, dr mukhopadhyay uh, for your questions because i liked your questions okay <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you ma'am thank you ma'am so momita yes ma'am i i i can leave okay yes ma'am yes ma'am please have lunch <laughs> okay thank you <laughs> okay okay ma'am thank you thank you thank Okay so with this we have come to the end of our webinar uh, i would take this privilege to convey my heartfelt regards to the keynote speaker of the day professor shomita basu uh, for devoting uh, this uh, enormous amount of time with us and also i would like to thank our two of the resource persons dr kerisa aditya and ms konkana pal uh, for motivating our students and i would like to thank our honorable principal professor dr montu kumar dash for inspiring us to arrange such webinars and supporting us throughout the process thank you sir i would also like to thank dr ashok kumar bondopadhyay the iqsc coordinator and head of the department physics khatal robindra satwarshiki mahavidyalay for his constant encouragement most importantly i wish to thank dr koshik ghosh head of the department chemistry for always being there and guiding us through the entire process thank you so for being so supportive <coughs> last but not the least i am thankful to all my colleagues of the chemistry department mr deepak kumar mukhopadhyay mrs vidisha maitri mondol and mr onupam maitri for their significant inputs and contributions in making this webinar a success i am also grateful to mr boshonto jana for all his technical support to run an uninterrupted webinar lastly i thank all the participants and our beloved students for their enthusiastic participation and i will be sending the uh, feedback link to all uh, the mail ids of all the attendees uh, by tomorrow again as we have exceeded today's uh, feedback uh, ex, uh, limit as limits uh, so i'll again mail it tomorrow and for the paper presenters i uh, will prepare a separate uh, set of certificates and send it to you uh, in mail so thank you all uh, to join us uh, in celebrating this uh, uh, international women's day and hope to have you soon with us again in our future uh, endeavors